Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Martin Barris. In this episode we talk about his friendship with colleague and mentor Beric Kayla, a wardrobe malfunction and how a horrendous accident resulted in him actually dying in real life. This is a fantastic episode that really chronicles an amazing career in pantomime. You can also find out more details as well from Beric's episode all the way back to episode number three. In the meantime, please sit back and enjoy the latest Panto podcast. Well, my guest today is the wonderful, comical and slightly madcap shall I say, Martin Barris. Thank you. I wrote most of that introduction, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Pardon the spelling on it, obviously. Well, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Martin, uh, for those people who may not have heard you outside of the walls of York, how would right. you best describe yourself? Um, um, unemployed. No, 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 no. Um, it's yeah, November it, soon. It's November soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tonight we eat. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the thing is, I was in, uh, I was in Tesco two days ago, and you know, you do get recognised. But this guy with the heavy, heavy hand, great big guy, looked like a sort of Liverpool docker. And just said, "Hey, you're a fella that's mad or just zany, running around and jumping up in the air." Went, to, yeah, I'm glad you've got the right person there, <laughs> and not the checkout girl. So, uh, so I, I think, I mean, you do. When I first did the pantomime, I remember Beric said to me. Uh, right, okay, you're playing my idiot song, I'm the dame, and I write it as well, and um, people will remember these pantomimes for years and years and years. And I was thinking, all right, it's, it's my first one, I'm nervous enough as it is. Uh, and he said, but you will get recognised in the street, uh, people will know you'll become like a kind of national treasure of York. Well, he's absolutely right. I mean, the first time that ever happened to me, I swear, it was down Gillygate, just around the corner from here, and a guy did a double take and walked straight into a lamppost. And I said, I said and he looked at me bleary-eyed, he said, it, it is you, isn't it? <laughs> I went, yeah, yeah, mate, are you sure you're all right? So uh, I don't know. I mean, I would like to think that um, I uh, I serve the part, uh, uh, entertain, and can be quite original at times as well, and do contribute to the writing of the uh, pantomime. Uh, I remember there's one year where uh, we're doing Dick Whittington. Of course, the story of Dick Whittington is that the family, the pantomime family, moved to London, and it's their adventures there with Dick Whittington. So uh, Beric wrote that year that we enter on a sort of London bus, like an omnibus, you know, and dressed. He's dressed as a pearly queen and pearly king, and it's all all right, darling, you know, cock me and all like that. Uh, anyway, so that was it, and uh, you know, his customary introduction is me babbies. Me bands, a real Sunderland greeting, you know, mm. so warm. Be bambies, be bands, followed by a funny introduction. He said, I'm really stuck this year, son. I can't think. I'm trying to think of a gag about, you know, pearly, pearly white teeth, pearly king. I, nothing's really amuses me. Anyway, it's coming to the first performance, right? And he just, you know, had said, got something in mind. They were really hysterical by his standards. So I came up to him in the wings. I said, Beric, Beric, how much do you love me? He said, I, I love you a bit. How much do you love me? He said, what do you want, money? I went, no, 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 no. Do you love me a lot? He said, yes, I've got your opening line, okay? Right, what are we standing on? Well, a bus. Then you say, welcome to the omnibus edition of Dick Whittington. <laughs> and he got a round of applause. <laughs> it's one big family, though, isn't yeah. it, here? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I mean, it is so, so fortunate to be... Working with you know your mates, uh, a job that you all pull together, you all enjoy. Uh, as you say, it gets round to November, which sometimes can't come quick enough, and you all meet for the uh, meet and greet there, cups of coffee, gags, what we've been up to during the year. And uh, I wouldn't have swapped this for the for the world for all the tea in China. It's it's just been absolutely phenomenal. Well, can I take you right back to the very beginning? Yes. Your, first your childhood, your, your childhood, child. your child. You're on a swing. The swing goes backwards and forwards. <laughs> With each swing, you lose a year of your life. Sorry, I, uh, I don't know what. To... We we could have had just a little special effect there, like a twinkle, <laughs> but no. <laughs> <laughs> the storm is at its height. <laughs> Right then, your your yeah. childhood then. How, yes, my childhood. What, did you come from quite a funny family? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. no, my dad was a plumber, 
uh, master plumber, took all his exams, became chairman of the Master Plumbers Association. Uh, really, really <laughs> intensely proud of him. My mum was, um, well, a housewife, really short and typist, and she was with the Towns Women's Guild, and they were always putting shows and concerts on. So I used to go and see them, and I thought, you know, I toyed with the idea of being, a, 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 well, I, a, a vet, then an astronomer, the thing is, these are all hobbies that you think of being, you know, a job, a professional. But with the vet, right, I discovered, oh, as soon as I went to high school, they said, you want to be a vet, right? So you've got to be good at sciences. I said, I'm good at sciences, yeah. For my chemistry exam, it said, what is a compound? I said, it's wire netting fence with Alsatian dogs around it. <laughs> Not out of 100. Um, and so therefore, um, when I was about eight, nine at junior school, they did a, a sort of pantomime. And I auditioned to play a Dalek. So uh, I, I, it was Dalek 1 and Dalek 2. And I got the part, Dalek 2. And I, I, this is true. I actually thought of doing it in a broad Yorkshire accent and saying, I am a dialect. <laughs> <laughs> so from then on, but there was a teacher who had it in for me a bit. And she said, I think she was trying to be kind about this. But she said, Martin, acting is a hobby. Now, I was a right little smart ass in those days, and I said, so all these film stars I see and television stars, they, they don't get paid. <laughs> that, oh. But that spurred me on. It's like, don't get ideas above your station. So I think that, like all things in life, it was a, a kick in the backside, and it was like, you know, if you, if you want to do this seriously, get your lines learnt, uh, investigate how to get into the acting profession. And so I did a couple of plays at high school. That's where I really, really enjoyed it. It was uh, The Visit by Frederick Durenmatt, which is a very heavy, heavy piece of uh, agit prop to be doing at 16 years old. And I was playing uh, Her Crank uh, in the uh, English translation. His name is Mr. Ill. Uh, and what happens in the story, briefly, is that uh, he has turned down this girl's advances when they're about 16. She becomes a millionaireess. She comes back. She says, right, I vow my revenge. So the, she buys off the whole town to slowly, uh, you know, come in and, 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 and murder him, ultimately. Uh, well, I was 16, and my family came to see it. And there's a scene where he's going, but the trains, the trains aren't going anywhere. No, Mr. Ill, the trains are not leaving anywhere. Not today. As the crowd all advance on you, even the realism of the piece is, right, lock the fire doors there, make sure the school doors are closed, we're all... So the audience are going, is, this isn't really happening, is it here? As, and then uh, somebody steps forward, uh, I don't know, the village blacksmith or whoever, and throttles me. And, and you don't see it really happen, but until the crowd parts, and there I am, sort of death throes and die. My grandma, she stood up. She was so convinced that I'd been killed on stage that she, when the millionaires came on, she said, you whore, you <laughs> bitch, you <laughs> killed my grandson. And my mum's going, no, 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 nana, nana, nana. It's, it's just a play. It's just a play. So, of course, the drama teacher next day was, was absolutely thrilled to bits. She said, I hope your grandma's all right. She said, yeah. But she said, that's what I wanted. I wanted that effect of... I, is this really happening now or what, you know? Uh, and then by contrast, the next play that I did at high school was um, Black Comedy, where the premise is that uh, there's the play opens, it's in pitch darkness, and uh, people are just talking, drinking cups of tea and saying, right, uh, when's your father arriving, all like that. And then suddenly all the lights come on and they go, oh no, what's happened? It's a fuse. I think it must be a fuse. So it's in reverse. And there's loads of great ideas and gags in it. So, I'd, so I played this extremely camp uh, antique dealer, Harold, <laughs> Harold Gorringe. And uh, I, remember, I remember one of the drama teachers very kindly, when I was about 17 then, she said, Martin, uh, it's, it's not the Martin Barra show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it was. <laughs> no, I'm not like that honest, really. So influences then... Obviously, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you like your serious acting, but yeah. there's a lot of comedy. Yeah, I mean, I think, without doubt, the greatest ever were Laurel and Hardy. And I've done the play uh, twice now. And it, it was, I mean, I'm not blowing my own trumpet at all, but uh, the late Ian Rogerson, who played Oliver Hardy, uh, but the Times came to see it, give it five stars, and that was tucked away at Hall Truck Theatre, uh, which is not 
by any means, you know, on the uh, on the radar of the big national papers. But this uh, this is a beautiful piece of theatre, and there are times where you're just seeing the boys themselves. Well, that is the greatest greatest compliment. Mm. Uh, people like Charlie Chaplin, Morecambe Wise, uh, Norman Wisdom, Frankie Howard, Kenneth Williams, Tony Hancock, with that oh, lugubrious sense of humour. Yes. <laughs> the blood donor sketch. <laughs> and it is, and it says, uh, Dr. McTavish will see you now. Oh, he's a Scot. Oh, road builders, engineers, medics, the Scots. And there he goes, I am the right, the new life, the next life. Yes, Mr. Hancock, sit down. <laughs> they tell you you're Scottish. Yes, well, we're not all Rob Roy's. <laughs> And uh, it's, the thing is, you, as Beric Kayla would say, is there's nothing really that's original. You all nick from each other. It's just the way you do it. And I would use the polite word of you being influenced by, mm. you know, by, by that performance. I think it's just something, like you were saying, it's a chord that strikes where you go, yeah. Uh, and I like, like with this podcast, so where people want to know, what your likes are, dislikes, your fears, you know, everything. So I think it just rounds your personality off. How did you get involved then with the whole truck theatre? Right. Uh, well, the thing is, I'm from Hull. I'm extremely proud to be from Hull as well. Uh, the city of Hull, not the town, as people often say. But uh, I first got involved uh, in the 80s and did a play, The Dock, uh, directed by John Godbert. Uh, and I remember the first, because uh, John's a pretty formidable character, you know, shoulders out here and everything, and, uh, and, and you know, a genius. And uh, he said, hey, uh, what are you doing for uh, lunch? And I said, uh, I don't know, get a sandwich. Ah, come with me. And he said, right, uh, I know I'm a big fella, but uh, I am uh, I'm a bit scared. I said, why? He said, this is the first play uh, I've directed that I've not written myself. So I said, is it really? He said, oh, yeah, even in college, I, uh, you know, almost did a version of Clockwork Orange, say, or something mm. like that. Uh, but that was great, and I went from strength to strength. Uh, I've done loads of productions there, like Up and Under, uh, April in Paris, and, as I said, Laurel and Hardy, and a lot of Richard Bean plays, who I think, along with John Godber and Aikborn, is our greatest writer. So I've done uh, The Hypocrite about a uh, whole city of culture, and uh, Honeymoon Suite, um, Out of the Whale Back, and uh, Up on Roof, uh, which was great. Uh, I mean, that was about the prison riots in, uh, in, in Hull in 1976. And I remember, well, I'm not, it's, it's not a spoiler alert here, but a mystery figure appears overnight, and he's got a crisp prison uniform on. He gathers as the middle of a riot started, nothing like that. He ends up getting killed... And they found, when they looked for the body in the morning, it's, it's gone. Uh, and this is what Richard Bean told me. He said, and I'm just writing it. Guess who the person is who arrived in the prison? I went, uh, Jesus Christ. He said, how did you know? Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's second coming. Well, the thing is, if Christ is going to come back, it could be Madagascar, it could be New York City, or it, or it could be Kingston upon Hull in Yorkshire. Uh, so, and it was quite credible. And it was a real thriller. Because the, the problem is, he said, with the riots, like I think a lot of uh, factual uh, uh, history drama, is you're saying, actually, not an awful lot happened. Yes, it was terrifying for the prisoners and the warders and everything, but... As a dramatist, I, I, I had to put another layer on it, but this is a working background as well, and I think it's, it's one of the best things I think is ever written. Um, so you probably want to know how I got started at York Theatre Royal. Well, I was actually going to say, down let's, the lane. let's rewind a minute, because you oh, mentioned yeah. Richard Bean, and he yes. actually wrote a part for you in one of his more famous oh, it, it, well, his it, most famous work. Well, it, the thing is, um, we've got on really well, and uh, my, bro my brother went to Hull Grammar School. I went to Kelvin Hall, which is the sort of secondary modern nearby to Hull Grammar School. It's only about 400 yards away. Um, but we, we had to travel across the city because it's the days at 11 plus. And my parents named the school Kelvin Hall, the neighbor school Hall Grammar. And both me and my brother said, yeah, but, but I mean, taking two buses every day or, or a circular bus right around the city, seven miles away, seven miles back. Anyway, that's what happened. And when I was chatting to Richard, I said, um, I, my brother tells me that you went to Hall Grammar School. He said, yeah, well, we're the same age. Uh, and did you get on the number 10 bus? He went well, every morning, yeah, seven years. 
I said, we must have sat next to each other. I don't know who you were. <laughs> um, so we, we got on, I mean, Richard's sense of humour is absolutely fantastic. And uh, so I think he's absolutely one of the best. So in that play, Up on Roof, he, uh, a character called Singe, uh, short for St John, Singe, I played that part. Then in 2011, so it's going back a fair bit, I got a phone call one morning and uh, Richard said, hi, hi, it's Richard here. Look, are you doing anything in the next four or five months? And I said, well, actually, I am. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Damien Cruden, artistic director of York Theatre Royal, for the 2011 season, it was like going back to the good old days of rep. It was, I think, about eight or nine shows in, in, in t running concurrently. And the auditorium here was turned into In the Round, which made it fascinating. So doing like The Crucible, My Family and Other Animals, Peter Pan, uh, 40 Years On, Laurel and Hardy. And it was just great. I mean, you know, nine months work for all of us actors as well. It was great. So Richard, I was sort of boring Richard death with this. I remember finishing all this and going, Richard, are you still there? He went, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, what's this about? Well, he said, well, the thing is, um, I put forward this idea uh, about, um, it's the uh, Goldoni play, Servant of Two Masters. And I said, oh, we did that at drama school. It's hilarious, you know, brilliant translations of it. It's the real deal. It's like the goon show on ice. It's just crackers. And he said, well, the thing is, um, it was going to be for next year, but there's been rescheduled and they want it to, that's why I said four or five months. And there's a part, it's not in the original, but I've written for you. Because he said, do you remember when I came to see the pantomime Sinbad, the sailor, which we did in 2006? And in that, uh, I had to slide front ways down these uh, 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 ladders that collapsed. Uh, then a staircase that collapsed, and then a fireman's pole, uh, and it was all b bonkers, but it's what I love doing, physical theatre. So Richard said, seeing you do all that, I have you in mind as this 87-year-old waiter who swings off a chandelier, gets smashed into a door, hit with a cricket bat, he's got uh, uh, an external pacemaker with a wire that gets turned to 10 instead of three, so you go bonkers <laughs> all around the audience. And I said, it sounds really exhausting. Yeah, I, I can't get out of this contract. I, I, you know, it, it's, oh my goodness, I don't know what to say, Richard. He said, well, no, no, it's great that you're working, but I, I will have to see someone else for it. Oh, no, no. Anyway, I said, oh, it's a closing shot. Where's it appearing? What theatre? He said, well, it's the National Theatre, then the West End. I thought, is it too early to have a glass of wine at half 11 in the morning? No, so <laughs> what happened was is that they chose, uh, the very talented Tom Eden played the part. Now, it got to, uh, it got to the, the next year and Richard rang me again. It's right in the middle of pantomime the next year. And uh, Richard here, I said, Richard, before we go any further, I've seen your reviews in The Guardian for One Man, Two Governors. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, you know, great. And the comic business with the doors and the stairs. He said, yeah, all right, just listen, listen to me. The great news is it's going to Broadway uh, for four months. I mean, that's fantastic. But it's going to recast to stay in West End. Right, it starts in February. Can you do it this time? I went... Well, yeah, because I, I, the, the panto finishes end of January, and that's it. We said, well, you've got the part. Well, apart from seeing the director, yeah, so obviously there was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Height and uh, Sir Nicholas at the National Theatre. So I did a few pratfalls, I read the whole part, and uh, so we're talking like that and everything. And, um, you know, 87-year-old man. Anyway, uh, in the read-through, I'd started, because uh, the first gag is, and this is Alfie, uh, he's got the tremors, he's uh, partially sighted, he's a bit deaf, he's, you know, all these things. And the uh, and your opening line is, uh, uh, I'm 86! No, 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 Alfie, you're not, you're 87. I thought I was 86! <laughs> no, no, that was last year. <laughs> and it just, it, I mean, there, there are some lines in it which are absolutely, totally bonkers. Like, um, um, I think there's on the pier, because it takes place in Brighton, the dodgy 60s, you know, lots of East End villains moving there. And uh, because, because, because my character is hard of hearing, you're getting all the uh, misunderstandings. So they say, right, they're on the pier. Oh, Alfie, have you seen The Gentleman? Oh, yes, it's first on your left. <laughs> and he goes, no, I meant the, oh, they had to put some newspaper down for me because I'd had a banana. <laughs> and you're going, 
what? I, I looked at the line, I thought, what does it even mean? But anyway, uh, as, you, as you gather, it was done with a bit of a northern accent because in the read-through, I was doing it sort of like that, a bit Kenneth Williamsy, and Richard Bean said, no, uh, let's have him as an ex hole trawlerman. So, in your broadest whole accent, I went, what, this is for the National Theatre? And I can just do this? He said, yeah, absolutely. It's everybody's got to be from somewhere. Um, but that was fantastic. So, we did for a year and a half. Um, and I remember I, I was lucky enough to stay at Richard Bean's place in Stoke Newington. Anyway, we'd been open about uh, five weeks. And he came back, and Richard had a big beam on his face. I said, you, you all right, mate? You know? He said, yeah, yeah, uh, fancy a glass of wine. I've got some rather good news. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the run's been extended. Uh, I said, that's fantastic. So it was from March to September. Now, obviously, this, this the York Theatre Royal pantomime, you know, nothing stands in its way. And I've been lucky that way because I, I've been able to work around it. Well, this time I thought, I said, Richard, I... I, I I, 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 I must do the extension to this play. I can't do the York Theatre Royal Panto. So he put the drink away. He said, no, you, you, you're you going to tell... Well, I'm going to tell the National Theatre of Great Britain that I want to go and do an 11-week pantomime at York Theatre Royal. He said, that's exactly what you must tell them. I said, Richard, could you tell them, please? I can't... I, so I told my agent this, and they said, what, you... That, that you want to go away from the National Theatre. I said, it's, it's just a break. Then put the understudy on. What a great chance for the understudy is as well. Mm. You know, That was exactly what happened. A week later, my agent said, you won't believe this. They've said, yeah, but could you come back as soon as you're finished there after 11 weeks? And so... But when I first heard I'd got this gig, the, the uh, One Man, Two Governors, I came in. The first person I saw was Damien Krugan, artistic director, and I told him, it was about half past five in the evening, you know, had a show to do, and I'd heard that I got the part that day. Uh, then I met Berwick, and he went, oh, and I, I sort of just burst into tears. Both of us did. He said, I am so pleased for you. It's what you deserve. It's really what you deserve. Great stuff. So anyway, uh, we started the show, and I came on, and I was about to say hello, girls and boys, and he just went, late. You're not in London now, you know. <laughs> anyway, and the audience sort of a bit uncertain of like, and it's like, you know, and, and, and as we were going through the whole show, there were quips all the time about, yeah, yeah, well, you have to get the Northern line if you go. And the audience stopped laughing. They're going, has he gone a bit mad, you know? And it's like, you know, you're not in the West End now, you know. Anyway, in the song sheet, in the request spot at the end, he said, listen, I've been pulling this lad's leg throughout the whole show. Right, now he's got some news to tell you. Okay, right, in your own words, son. Right. So I thought, can't you tell? You know, I feel a bit so big headed saying that. So that was it. And uh, it was just so great to do. It, it was, I remember, because my mum, when she was alive, uh, I would send her cuttings and everything, uh, a bit like the Tom Courtney book when he was writing home to his mum. And uh, after one show, I said, Guess who was in the audience tonight? And this, uh, she said, I, I don't know, what, rock star or something? Uh, the, the Pope? I said, even bigger than that. Not the Queen. I went, yeah, the Queen, Prince Philip. And what Nick Heitner, the director, had said is, because uh, it was just announced as we were doing Curtain Call, we just finished the whole show and they said, right, everybody, we couldn't tell you for security reasons, but Prince Philip and the Queen are there. Lights are going to come up any second now for your Curtain Call. We can't get to meet her, unfortunately, but it's an incognito visit. The audience have just realised who it is. You know, Tom, one look at the face and said, that reminds me, I must buy a stamp. So uh, we... <laughs> <laughs> we, I, we, we, Nick Hyde was talking to her and he said, uh, right, uh, all of you. And he kind of looked at, I'm not being big-headed, but he kind of looked at me and he said, uh, um, make sure you get an evening standard paper tomorrow. I said, I will, we'll be in about this. He said, yeah, make sure you get, uh, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Anyway, he was sort of in the know about this and I read the article and it says, Queen makes a surprise visit to West End show because her uh, nieces and nephews, they'd seen it and said, uh, you know, sorry grandchildren seen it said grandma you really must see this so uh they, they arrived by black cab uh, there was no red carpet uh but as i say and they were sitting with the public it's unthinkable really um but anyway i just looked at the review and it said uh, the queen uh, you know not not a massive fan of theater as charles is you know loves it but not a massive fan of theater but she was laughing 
almost hysterically at the antics of an 87 year old waiter called oh. Alfie <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> so of course I, I, I next day I sent that to you know, my kids and everything and they showed it at school I mean there are just times where you've got to be a little bit big headed and just because you don't know when the next opportunity is going to come along and you pinch yourself I'm sure and you pinch yourself absolutely yeah and I remember I remember the night Liza Minnelli was in as well and she was in the fifth row, and bless her, because she's a, a performer, uh, she enjoyed it, and she led the standing ovation. And then we met her at the end, oh, and she said, uh, uh, you give me a kiss on the cheek, you know, and I have never washed that cheek yeah. since. <laughs> um, but she's so fantastic, such a little dynamo. And she said, so Martin, uh, do you ever hurt yourself when you're falling? And I said, uh, no, but I think I'm about to faint now meeting you. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no, so it was... You old flirt, you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got the kettle on. <laughs> oh, isn't that wonderful? Though? Yeah, it, it, it was. The whole thing was so great because um, the first six weeks or so of opening the show at the Haymarket Theatre Royal, which I think it's the oldest West End theatre, sort of the most beautiful inside, uh, it was just big posters without production shots, which was a bit unusual for a, a West End show. Maybe they're just waiting for all the reviews to come through or whatever, because you, you do about, we did about 22 previews. You know, regional theatre, you, you're lucky if you get two dress rehearsals in and then mm. the audience is in, but with West End, lots riding on it. So uh, I'd gone up to, uh, come up to York, whereas I did every, every Sunday, see the kids, see the missus, and get the train back sort of lunchtime on a Monday. Anyway, I come to the theatre and I go, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. There's an eight-foot figure of me. <laughs> and it's, I'm sorry, this is going to turn your stomach, folks, this, but it just said under the comic perfection. And you think, oh, my. So, of course, the first person you ring, I ring my mum. Of course you of do. Course. Says, mum, you, you have got, I can't wait to see the show. It's just got this, they're dying, you're going to be there trying to open a wine bottle. And, oh, yeah, great, great gags. And luckily, there's a video of you on the Time Out. Time Out. Time Out videoed it, didn't they, for YouTube? That's, that's right, of how to uh, open a bottle of wine and knock yourself out at the same time. How to hang on to a door and go bang. And it's, it's all tricks of the trade. Uh, the most difficult one was, if you can picture, dear audience, uh, when my um, pacemaker has been turned up to ten instead of its normal three, obviously I go round and round and whiz around the stage at high speed. Stanley Stubbers, who was the kind of a hero of the play, uh, picks up a cricket bat from the wall, because the pubs call the cricketers, and as I come round again, he delivers a perfect cover drive to my head, which just knocks me stone dead on the floor. And how you do that is, if you imagine it's a front-on, I mean, you couldn't do this in the round, it has to be a front-on audience. So I am actually, from what an audience looks like, it looks as if the cricket bat is hitting the tip of my chin, when in fact the distance separating us uh, away from the audience is about a foot or 18 inches but as I say from from a view one end on it looks as if the two uh, planes have caught each other uh, and of course it was a really sickly click like yeah. that, or, or crack you know <laughs> it, coming from the wings the stage manager would time it you know exactly um, but if you want to get onto that it's, yeah, it's a time out uh, I mean they call it master I'll, I'll put a little link on so absolutely, people can yeah, watch yeah, it yeah. as well that was great 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 fun to do it uh, yeah yeah it was, it was nice but to a completely empty theatre and just a film camera because <laughs> by then we'd been doing it about 10 months I was you know used to performing it but I, I just I love uh, I mean drama schools don't teach tumbling or how to land properly uh, and the thing is, you've got to land properly because if you, do, well, if you don't land properly, an audience worry and they think, oh, are they really injured? Mm. Uh, if it's a serious play or a tragedy or a thriller, that's probably okay. But it's a killer for comedy, so you've got to learn lightly or you'll be light on your feet about these things. And you've got to, the easier you make it look, the easier on the eye it will be. But that takes a lot of practice. Um, if you enjoy doing that sort of stuff, then great. And I think pantomime is, you know, I mean, once I heard I was going to do pantomime, I thought this is my absolute dream come true because I'd done Christmas plays before where there was a kind of token, I mean, one was a version of Paddington Bear or something where I think I, as the trolley man at Paddington Station, I scalded my hand on the, uh, 
you know, the tear, and then that was the slapstick. Uh, it was, it, so I was itching you to get going. You were more, yeah. I wanted custard pies, I wanted grippy tanks of water, <laughs> and, you know... And boy, did you get them here Oh, York, boy, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. then, going back then to where we were going to go, or where yes. you were going to go, um, for your first introduction to York, Berwick, how come, how come you actually got involved here? Well, um, York was always a posh day out for people from Hull. Mm. York is where you come <laughs> if it's raining so you can't go to the seaside. And the first thing we saw when we came to York was Clifford's Tower. So what we did, of course, like any kid would, you got to the top and rolled down the sides of it there, <laughs> using the keep off the grass signs as brakes. <laughs> So we came to Castle Museum, uh, the Victorian Street that you get. I absolutely loved it. And but my first trip to York Theatre Royal was not to see an English play because I did French A level. It was to see a French troupe play here, and very good they were. Though I was taking A level French, I didn't understand a word of it. Uh, but it was great, and I'd never been to this theatre because I think as a family on a day out, you don't perhaps do that. Or if you're staying over, then you would. But being in Hull, it's only 40 miles away, an hour, so we wouldn't be staying in York. Um, so I saw that, and then I was living uh, in uh, London in the 80s, and I got this uh, audition. Uh, my agent said, right, York Theatre Royal, Michael Winter would like to see you. Uh, it's in Pimlico Arts Centre. Uh, you're in London anyway, so you just need to get on the tube, and it's next Tuesday. So I read it, and I didn't hear anything for four months. Because this was about the springtime, and it was a show that was going to start rehearsing in late July. Well, as you think, you you know you haven't got it, and you know it's that sort of thing where I could pick the phone up, but I don't want to hear bad news from my agent. Why don't I just write to York Theatre Royal? So almost by return of post from Michael Winter. Oh no, no, you're definitely in the frame. It's just that we're, we're working out the configuration of actors, and it, we've just frozen the casting. But you're definitely in the frame. So things really picked up for me because at the same time I'd got an audition for Emmerdale or Emmerdale Farm as it was called then well when I, when I was in it it was just an allotment <laughs> you know but uh, so I, I went along to that I thought now this because the year had been not great financially and I thought if, if I could get both of these things I'm not being greedy but if I could get both it would be brilliant TV and theatre and a chance to work at beautiful York so Anyway, the Emmerdale one, I went in and I were in the waiting room and this was Yorkshire Television's London offices. Uh, you'd have got the ones in Leeds as well. But this is one in Golden Square in the middle of London. So I sat there and I thought, and I looked, right, I know him off a shampoo advert. I know him from a soap. I know all these TV faces. Uh, and it was a really hot afternoon. And I walked in, yeah. Ah, uh, Mr. Martin Barris, yeah. No, that's me, yeah. Right, uh, and the guy suddenly put his head in his hands, and I thought, is it me? I, I haven't even, I've just said my name, and he's in despair. I said, are you all right? He went, please, just tell me you're from Yorkshire. I went, well, I'm from all. Yeah, th that's in Yorkshire, isn't it? Of course it is, it's <laughs> East Yorkshire. And uh, he said, right, it's just that we've had every accent under the sun. Agents have just been really, you know, pushing the envelope here. It, it, right, let's say you read, anyway. Uh, anyway, that was that. And the next day, I remember I was going to uh, watch with my brother uh, an England cricket match at the Oval. And, of course, this is pre-mobile days. Now, I was... I, I just thought, because I'd not had an audition for, uh, you know, such a long time. There was the one I was waiting on that was four months before. The, the one I'd had yesterday. So I said to my brother, I said, right, listen, um, I'm just going to phone my agent see if there's any news or anything. Because, of course, in those days you had to do that. They mm -hmm. couldn't contact you at the Oval Cricket Ground. So we are sitting there and it was lunchtime. And I said, uh, Martin, where have you been? Where have you been? Well, I said, it, it, it's, it's a red letter day. You've got the York job. What? What, 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 do you know what part? Well, it's the lead. You're playing Laurie Lee, side with Rosie. But what? I said, but even better, you've got 17 episodes, and that's just for starters, with Emmerdale. What? I just couldn't believe it. The, and the, it worked out that I just had to miss uh, the first day of the read-through for Side with Rosie. Uh, and then finish, once I finished the, the whole run of Side with Rosie, like seven weeks plus rehearsal, uh, it was back to do Emmerdale. And uh, I, I just... Could, oh, and that day, of course, at the Oval, is that I just 
I asked everyone if they wanted a drink. <laughs> People I'd never met before. <laughs> Even Australians. <laughs> You must have been in a good mood then. <laughs> oh, that was that was absolutely. It was a phenomenal day and a phenomenal year, uh, and that was just the year before I started in the pantomime. So how did that happen? So uh, I done yes, I done side with Rosie. Then I did um, in 1984. They said, right, we we know you're 28, right? But do you think you could play a 15 year old? Uh, well, uh, I, I, and it, funnily enough, I was clearing my garage out earlier this week and I looked at the production photographs. I thought, oh my God, I, I, because, well, I, I, I said yes, of course, playing Billy Casper, you know, come on, kids, come on, kids. <laughs> so, uh, uh, playing Billy Casper. Now, we had obviously some schoolroom scenes, there's a lot of schoolroom scenes, so we used 15, 16 year old kids. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to shave five times to look like them. <laughs> but looking at these, if I'd have brought them in to show you, Hayden, you're going, actually, there ain't a lot of difference, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what, it, maybe it was my diet at the time or something, but I did pass for it, you know. And, and, and so my two brothers, who were my sternest critics, you know, I said, they said, yeah, 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 you pulled it off, honestly, it, it, it worked. So that was Andrew McKinnon who directed, and uh, he'd said, uh, Listen, um, um, before you go back to London, where you're living, uh, I would have a word. Would you fancy meeting Beric Kayla? I said, Beric, Beric Kayla? He's a legend. He does a pantomime here. That says, yeah. Well, the guy who plays his idiot son is doing something else. I think he's on a world tour or something like that. Would you like to you know, be seen for the part? Oh. Oh, God, I can't stop shaking. Like, Absolutely. So I uh, said, right, OK. And what happened was Beric at the time was doing uh, Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. So I, I planned on seeing his Bottom later that morning. Mm. And uh, so, you know, Andrew said, well, it's a good idea because, you know, to, 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 to help your cause, because I think you'd be ideal for it. I really do. Uh, to help your cause, I think, uh, go and see him. Have a chat with him. Right, uh, okay. So uh, I went along and uh, Beric said something like, the, uh, you know the uh, Tottenham Court Road uh, YWCA? I said, why WCA? I'm not a member. He said, no, 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 it's just somewhere to meet. Oh, right, yeah, 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 okay. Why WCA? Not, not why MCA, no. Why WCA? Tottenham Court Road. So we met, and I could tell he was quite nervy, uh, because he, it, I was quite nervy as well, because I think it was like a, uh, a high-tension situation of he wants it to work, and he doesn't want to tell me, thanks, it's great being meeting you for this hour, but Fred, you ain't got the gig. And I'm going, oh, please give it a kick, because I just, honestly, you know, can't tell you enough. Uh, anyway, so I said, right, but I'm coming to see you. I've got a ticket uh, for Midsummer Night's Dream. He said, you didn't buy it, did you? I would have got you one. And, oh, I don't mind. After I, Anyway, I booked it. So what I saw was the greatest ever comic performance in a Shakespeare I've ever seen. He did it all broad Sunderland, you know, real we aside. The words were so crystal clear, the timing... Such is such that in the interval, to a lot like uh, tourists, Americans, or whatever, and they're saying, that guy, what, Ber Berwick? I look in the program, he's Newcastle. And I sort of said, oh, actually, I think you'll find it Sunderland. <laughs> hey, you know the guy? <laughs> well, I'm hoping to know him better, really, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, it, 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 honestly, his, he, it, it's as if he was making the words up. And I just sort of recheck and think, no, that's exactly what Shakespeare wrote for Bottom, The Midsummer Night's Dream. He really, really made it his own. And it was um, quite... St there was, uh, uh, Ronald Fraser was in it. Um, I'm trying to remember who the actress who was in that programme Triangle years ago. Uh, Kate O'Mara. Kate O'Mara. Kate O'Mara. Ronnie Fraser. Uh, you know, the, 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 the names that you'd know, mm. like household names. Anyway... After the show, I was in a state of, you know, sort of excitement. And uh, I said, do you know what Beric Kayla drinks? And he said, uh, yes, a vodka and Coke. I said, right, is that, a, is that a drink, vodka and Coke? Well, it is the Beric Kayla, yeah. Right, uh, could I have a large one, please? And uh, so eventually Beric came out. He was one of the last to come out. The rest of the cast were all sitting around the table. Uh, it's the Open Air Theatre, by the way, I should have said. Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. So it's a beautiful summer's evening, which was about to get better. So uh, it, it, Beric comes up to me there. I said, oh, man, 
That is the bet. He said, never mind all that. Call me all the cast. Right, he said, this is Martin Barris. Uh, he's going to be playing my son at York Theatre Royal Pantomime. Wow. <laughs> I said, are you crying? I said, no, no, I am. I, um, but but it, it was, and I lived in Balm at the time. So the journey uh, from Balm, from it, right open air theatre, Regent's Park is about seven miles. And I just walked on air all the way home. I just could not believe it. And now on the first day, uh, the read through for the pantomime starts in about November, mid November time. And uh, so I come on, uh, I come on Hello Girls and Boys, and then usually what happens is, uh, oh, here comes my mam, whatever. And then he comes on, does his opening bit. So I'm a bit like warming the audience up. So I remember I went, Hello Girls and Boys, are you all gunning? Are you? And I just see this look from Barry. This very slow burn, just looking. <laughs> and I carry on, you know, doing all sorts of accents. Like, well, I'm playing a song, you know, mind. So, and uh, anyway, in the interval, he said, yeah, can I just have a word? Um, I know what you're doing there, with the sort of Geordish Northeast accent. I just make him like, he said, I saw you in uh, Kez. I went, did you? What, York City Royal? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Some sort of Barnsley. Hey, up, all right, right, so to Yorkshire accent, you know. He said, uh, I'd do that. Uh, and he's absolutely right because of the madness of it, because of the madness of Susie Cooper's cut glass accent there, you know, Knightsbridge, whatever, who very often is playing my sister. So you're thinking, is the Dame's Geordie Sunderland uh, very posh, Cheltenham Girls College, and he's a right tyke with Barnsley accent. Um, and then David Leonard, who's a lawn to himself. Um, <laughs> So he's absolutely right. Now, then what happened was day three. So day three, he says, listen, I said, no, it's not about the accent again. Is it, is it terrible? He went, no, no, the accent's fine. The accent's fine. Um, I've been thinking, you're very physical as an actor. I said, oh, Beric, I can't wait for the slapstick and all that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you skip everywhere? So, what, did you, what did you say? Skip. You know, like skip in the playground. I mean, a manly skip, not a, you know, nothing in feet. Uh, just, you know, best advice I ever got in my life. The best note from a fellow actor I've ever received. <laughs> you spend most of the time in the air and you just bounce and bounce and bounce around. Um, it's, I mean, the ideal footwear are Converse trainers because that's what I wore in the start there and I wore ever since. Occasionally, a character has to wear something a bit more shoe-like and it's a bit more difficult to skip there. But absolutely, and uh, I've just got to tell you this, that on the third um, performance of the pantomime that year, Sinbad the Sailor, there's a rocking cabin scene where it's, it's actually half of a caravan sliced in half. And, and so, so there are unseen from the audience, our stage crew members who rock it furiously. Water comes through the portals. Uh, at one point I fly out of the portal. Uh, at one point Berry comes back, he's flown through the portal, comes out with a, an octopus on his head. And I say, do you know there's an octopus on your head? And he says, no, you hum it, I'll sing it. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, I remember saying to the uh, 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 wardrobe person that, that I said, look, look, I, I'm, uh, I know it's early on in the run, but I'm going to be late for this slapstick scene. Uh, I, I, and, and she'd gone off, and I thought, I can't, find my t I can't even find my um, Converse trainers. With, I've got the night shirt, because it's meant to be bunk beds or like that rocking mm. cabin. Uh, I can't. So I went on in bare feet. Big mistake. The very first uh, rock, I, I was a bit unsteady there, because there's nothing to grip on, and it's a canvas floor. <laughs> anyway, I kind of survived it all, and then, just towards the very end of the scene, I was, uh, 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 was the, the rocking gets absolutely furious and Beric was at one end of the cabin there and I felt, so see he was on to my right uh, there and I was at the left where the porthole is and where the final deluge takes place. Anyway, I fell and hit my head really quite badly and just didn't think anything more of it. So then what happens is the cabin comes to a slow halt and then the dialogue just follows of bucket water and we're sitting side by side. Ma'am, bucket water. Yes, son, bucket water. You think it's finished? I'm not sure. Then pulls like a, a cord where this massive load of water comes down. So anyway, after hitting my head and Beric hadn't seen any of this at all, we sat in the bunk bed and the scene follows of ma'am. Anyway, they're all pointing at me, the stage crew, and the bucket water. It didn't hit either me or Beric in the face. It was, it was just like a limp lettuce, you know. 
and Derek whispered to me, what's going on? What's going on? What's on? Water, the same thing. It doesn't, anyway, it gets up after the end, the whole scene, da-da, that's it, curtain down. And he said, right, in a few chosen words, what on earth is going? And then looked at me, because he hadn't seen my left side, it was just covered in blood, the whole, so the audience, I wonder why they stopped laughing. So it was like, so Barry just fainted. He was just like, bang. And, uh, and so I got bandaged up and, um, I hope drop names here, but Mark Addy and Ben Cole were the next people to be on stage, followed by Beric. So it was a very quick change out of the slapstick scene. And so he's got a scene with the broker's men. Anyway, he said, uh, right, Bobby's, uh, my son's had a bit of an accident, right? He was going to try and tell you that it's ketchup, but uh, <laughs> I think it's real blood. Uh, anyway, he's had an accident. That's because the silly son so didn't wear his shoes or he was late for the scene. We'll discuss that one later. Uh, anyway, so he did 10 minutes of stand-up conversation with Mark and Ben and then kept looking to the wings. Is the, is the lad ready yet? Uh, yeah, nearly there, nearly there. <laughs> so then came on to great applause with this banter on my head. Um, and I've done that once since in my career where you, and it was in One Man to Governors, and it's when my mam came to see me, my, my mother, and because uh, she was not well enough to see it until a few months into the run. And there's a bit where the pacemaker uh, is 10 up to 10, so we whiz around the table, uh, run up at the door, and I tried to reach the, the, the ceiling just by standing on the doorknob, uh, and then whiz around again, hit, get hit by the cricket bat, collapse. So when my mum was in, I ran at the door and unlike the video with Time Out that you will see how to do it safely, is I propelled myself to the door so hard that I banged and split the skin on my head. So of course the consequent scenes there, bandages on. But Richard Bean said to me, but that's what was meant to happen in the original draft. <laughs> that the bandage gets bigger until it's like a <laughs> turban. <laughs> well, it's, it's not the first time that or not the last time, shall I say, you've appeared on stage, or, or, how can I put it? Um, that's not the last time that we saw you at the Theatre Royal with a bandage on your head. Yes. Because you were absent, uh, how many years ago was it? Oh three, my goodness, it was three, almost, three. almost to the day. Is it really? And it was weather like this as well. Oh. I'd started at uh, 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 Theatre by the Lake, Keswick. When I, oh, I'll just take you back to this. Um, it, it, it started um, about three weeks after the Panto finished that year of 2016. So only talking a short two, three years ago. And uh, I got the job, The Shepherd's Life. And it was playing multi-role characters. Um, there was, um, yes, I remember there, there was, uh, yeah, in, in performance, you know when you're dry or you can't remember the lines. There's one bit where in The Shepherd's Life, I'm playing a top inspector. Uh, the top being the male sheep. And I had this hilarious line, was, I'm looking at its fleece, going, yeah, good eyes, nice fleece. And then underneath its body, just to see if it's got its manhood there, <laughs> the actual line is, yes, and full complement of testicles. Right, which got a nice mm. bit of a gruff laughter from the audience. But it's anatomy, so it's, you know, funny, it's all right. Anyway, full complement of testicles. So we come to the line, right, the top inspector, I'm going, what? What's that? What? I, do, I don't know what the line is. I can't. I know about the fleece. I know about the eyes. And you're thinking, I've done this play now about two weeks, but I can't. Anyway, something came out. The good old brain. It thought of something. And a full testament of complicles. To which <laughs> the guy I was meant to be buying the sheep from, he's got a tin mug next to his mouth, Kieran Hill. And he just went, <laughs> and he, all I could hear was teeth hitting tin. And he's going, <laughs> And of course, then you've got to look the actors in the eye you know, afterwards. Mm. So, um, oh my goodness, but Keswick Theatre by the Lake. I remember I set off about six o'clock. It was uh, February, March time. And uh, I got to the uh, where I was staying, just outside Keswick. And the landlady, she said, she said to me, I haven't opened the curtains yet in your room. I'm thinking, hello, what's happening here? Uh, and she said, you'll see why. And she said, you're ready for this. She parted the curtains. Ah, oh, it was. All the mountains with snow, all the lights come up, the little churches. You know, it's one of the ugliest sights I've ever seen. Mm. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was one of the most beautiful sights on earth. 
And then I got to the theatre, which is next to Derwent Water, and it is, I think it was built in the 80s there. It is just absolutely great. And the whole great experience, again, with the community cast there, people of Keswick and some of them farmers as well. And um, James Rebanks, uh, we went to see his house. He's written the book. I never realised that the when I was going to do the play, uh, my, my younger brother, who's a graphic designer, he said, did you just say The Shepherd's Life? James Rebanks. Well, yeah. He said, you know, it's been... Uh, hardback, uh, number one, the Sunday Times book list, and paperback. It's top of the list in both. Everyone in Islington talks about <laughs> The Shepherd's Life, and you're going to do it? Uh, and when he came to see it, he said, it's one of the best things he's ever seen. And he said, have you managed to get my book signed by James Rebanks? I went, yeah, there it is. Yeah. So it's fantastic. And I had such great experiences there. And one of the biggest you know, things that happened to me was I'd never ridden a motorbike before. And on the first day of rehearsals, uh, if you can picture uh, what we've got in front of us at the moment, Lee, uh, is a, a, like a black microphone and a beautiful chrome one. And that's what the motorbike looked like. It looked like a 50s classic. It's actually a Quang Yang Motor Company Zing. And if you Google that, every one of their bikes looks like a 1950s repro. Uh, Quan Yang used to be part of Honda, whatever, da 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 So it would suggest that the name's really modern, but the bikes look... And I just thought, do you know what? Imagine riding that motorbike through the, the lakes or, or whatever. Anyway, they said, well, Adam, who's on the stage crew, he wants to sell it. Does he? Right. And I thought, well, the motorbike... It... Anyway, got a long story short, and uh, we did a swap. He'd always wanted a camper van, so he gave me a cash sum of money... Uh, and we did a, 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 a swap and I borrowed his car just to have four wheels just to tide me over so it was a great deal made in heaven and which it very nearly was <laughs> and uh, so I've been riding around on the motorbike I take my CBT training test which is compulsory you've got to uh, take it if, if you don't go in for your proper full test Two, within two years of that CBT, compulsory bike training, you've got to sadly take the CBT all over again. It's like going back to nursery. So it's the way the government say, pass your test properly. So anyway, I did everything absolutely safely by the rule book there. Press on the brake pedal, foot pedal first, then hand pedal after that. Otherwise you could be in trouble. Um, and I used to go around to people's houses and say, you know, listen, I'm just going to um, go to Tesco's on the motorbike. There's it, Martin, Martin, just... Just go out and enjoy your motorbike. We don't want any more shopping in. It's coming out of our gills now. I said, all right. And I just absolutely hated the, the... I thought this is another dimension. It's like being on a flying carpet. You're into the... There's the elements there. And it's... But someone said to me, that's when it's good weather. In winter, it's quite a different story. Um, as my dad used to say about plumbing, you know. Mm. Oh, yeah, when you're at drama school, you know, on your summer break and helping me out. It's all bright mornings and that. You're trying in winter. <laughs> uh, so I said to my kids, well, teenagers now, but I said, listen, um, I'm going to see, uh, there's a friend of mine appearing at Keswick Theatre by the Lake. Uh, in uh, Keswick do it a whole play season. You know, the, some of the actors stay there for seven, eight months. Uh, so it was an actress, uh, she was doing in, in the play uh, uh, Watch It Sailor, which is a sequel to um, uh, Watch It Sailor, what's it? Um, oh, Sailor Beware, that's her, Sailor Beware. 1950s, 60s, I think that's an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to that. Um, so I went to see her in it, in Watch It Sailor, and it was great. I stayed over at Adams, who bought the bike off, and then set off back. Now, uh, from it's about 110 miles uh, from uh, Keswick to York and I thought I'd take the scenic route uh, it's the longest journey I'd made apart from going from York to Keswick the day before uh, and it was gorgeous gorgeous weather so I stopped in Settle uh, just to have a break and because with a load of motorbikes parked up and I like to think I was a bit of a biker I've got my <laughs> jacket and all you know hi gang I'm one of you now there was, uh, I thought, God, I haven't really had anything to eat, though. And it's still quite a long way to York. So there's bakers there. And the baker, the queue was quite big. And I thought, Do you know what, I'll just press on. Had I bought a sausage roll from there and it been delayed me setting off, then I might not you know, have this good traumatic story to tell. Um, and, you know, even before I'd set off for this journey to see the play, uh, my lad said, Dad, why don't you just drive there in the car? I said, no, no, I'm making a pilgrimage. I'm taking the motorbike back to its spiritual home. 
All right then, all right then. So anyway, right, I'm on the road and the sun's shining. It's just before three o'clock and a car pulls out of the country lane. Now this is a busy A59, so it's a real, real trunk road lorries and everything like that. And in a split second, and it must have been less than a second, I thought I can't do anything but hit the car. I can't, I'm probably gonna go under it. Uh, and I, that's what did happen. Because the car uh, had pulled out and it stayed at a diagonal on my lane of traffic there. So I just tried to apply the brakes, foot brake first, hand brake first, in that quarter of a second there and went bang and ended up under the car um, I then remember thinking I'm actually still here I mean I've never been in an accident before but that was like being hit by a hundred sledgehammers and so the driver was frozen in time as were the passengers it was like the home alone stance and uh, I got out from under the car and I remember taking the helmet off and thinking the helmet is really easier than usual to take off there anyway took it off tapped on the window and said to the driver i've never been in an accident before is this what it's like and then my eyes closed and i fainted backwards but it banged my head quite hard so i should have kept should have kept the crash helmet on uh, and i don't know who phoned for the yorkshire air ambulance but when i went back to thank them after i came out of hospital 10 weeks in hospital I thought I thank the Yorkshire Air Ambulance, thank the uh, Leeds uh, Infirmary Intensive Care, and St James's in Leeds, all those institutions. And uh, I, when I got to Yorkshire Air Ambulance, uh, they said, it's, "Martin, you're here a bit early, and it's really good that you're here a bit early." I said, "What? Why? We've got someone want to meet." Right, this is Lee Green and Al Day. They were the guys who saved your life on the roadside. I was like, I can't be guys, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm beholden to you for the rest of my life. Um, I said, you know, the question I've got to ask, if there hadn't been one available, a helicopter, he said, you, we wouldn't be having this conversation because you wouldn't be here. I said, really? He said, well, it took us 12 minutes to get you to the rooftop of Leeds uh, General Infirmary. And um, I mean, I, it's a bit gruesome, but the thing is that there were, when I came to from the induced coma, there was, uh, I told them I got 18 ribs uh, cracked. I said, how many have we got? I said, we got six left. So that's, that's, um, and the problem was, they said, you know, as roadside attenders, and these, these medics for the air ambulance are the creme de la creme. I mean, they are absolutely amazing. And I mean, they, 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 they improvise an operating theatre on the roadside or a hillside or, or in a ditch. And, um, they said the problem with us was what to go for first because both lungs had collapsed and uh, it's unusual because it's normally just one. So he said it's a good job that you were conscious because it's a very painful way of reinflating them and that's if it works. Because what happens is when your body goes into shock, when you've got high impact, is that the air actually literally goes through the, the skin that the lung is made of into your torso, which, you know, it's like a pressure chamber, which in then is, is unfortunately flattening the lung. So what they do is they stick tubes under your armpits and they withdraw the air. Anyway, it was totally successful. I said, then to try and get your heart going. I said, well, you mean get the heart going? It stopped about five minutes, which is, yeah, I think that's, yeah. bit, bit, to come to terms with that is, is, and again, I said, did you use the, uh, 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 what was it? Uh, the uh, defibrillator. That fit. Yeah, that's a defibrillator. Yeah, and said no because we had figured that the heart was healthy, completely healthy, and it was just the manipulation. So that was that was fine. And there's broken leg and the liver, which which can regenerate itself. It's a real Doctor Who organ. Apparently, the liver and the tongue are the are the organs that can regenerate. And uh, at the end of it, I mean, this was like four or five months down the line. Um, the you say when I came to, they, they said, right, well, this isn't a word that we use in the medical profession, but I can use it because I'm a nurse. Uh, is that uh, miracles taken place? You, you, we cannot believe you've come through this, and that you are a hundred percent recovered because well, it just it is beyond the realms of belief. I said, well, it's because of you guys. You've done it. You've done all the work, you know. Uh, and um, yeah, it, 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 the, the liver specialist, he said, Mr. Barris, it is true. Uh, a liver can regenerate itself 100%. In your case, it has. And I never want to see you again. 
so it's big handshake and it's it's I, I just but i tell you what i'd never i'd never i've been led a very sheltered life i'd never heard of the drug ketamine before i really <laughs> i didn't even know how it's pronounced <laughs> i really did not this is honest truth oh boy the my daughter when i said could i list everything that happened in my dreams because they were just they were oh it was it was incredible because i've been doing railway children after Keswick Theatre by the Lake for about six months at King's Cross Theatre, all things railways, you know, Oakworth, Mr. Perks, all like that, uh, must have been on my mind under the ketamine drug. That was to induce the coma. And uh, so I was trapped on trains uh, full of people, tweed automatons. Uh, one guy was an old colonel, and he was like, hello, boy, you had a bit of a knock. And I would offer this, this like, flask of brandy. And then you'd look, and you'd go, hello, boy, you had a bit of a knock, and offer it. And that it went on for about 500 times. And then his eyes closed, and another adventure. And then uh, people were pouring lead into my... Uh, plaster cast leg there uh, and, and it was getting heavier and heavier because I had broken my ankle as well um, and it was just bizarre I remember I, I I tried to escape the train and there were the and it was at York Station uh, but this York Station had lots and lots of steps like St Paul's Cathedral so I couldn't quite get through the doors and then one time I actually made it I forced the automatic doors through uh, but my eyesight which is still quite impaired from, from the crash. My eyesight was quite like, hor uh, well, diagonal almost. I'm thinking, oh, I can't balance here. I can't, I can't actually see what I'm doing. So I sat down on the stairs and with my bum, I shuffled all the way down to the, to the bottom. And I thought, I've done it. I've done it. Anyway, by, night by now it's night time and it was pouring with rain and people were just walking by and not paying me any attention. And I thought, I can get home. I know it's two miles to Huntington, North York, but I can get back home. So I shuffled on my bottom all the way through the rain and the night and people, you know, hello. Yeah. And, and I eventually got to the house. Now, I opened the door and all my family were dressed as in a photograph, like uh, mannequins with 70s tank tops on and all in model <laughs> poses. And they were all talking, but no mouths were moving or anything. They were just completely still like photographs, you know, like, oh, you're alive and hi, dad, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and it, so I've asked my daughter to, if she would catalogue, I mean, that's about a hundredth of the sort of stuff that went on and some quite scary moments as well. Uh, but that, you know, and, and it was when you come out of that sort of coma, when you've been a deep coma, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it you realise you don't want to go back in that one again. Mm. But unfortunately, my friend came around and uh, uh, he was just reading some news items to me. And I suddenly went, oh, oh, like that. And he thought I was play acting. He said, oh, you're well enough to start doing funny voices. <laughs> it's going, oh, it's ice, ice. What, what's ice? And it was pneumonia. Uh, just, I, I think because when you're quite vulnerable, these things can just happen. Where the lung goes, it's, it malfunctions. Uh, anyway. Thankfully, this time I was only put in a coma for about half an hour, and that's it, and touch wood. Uh, but it, it was, I just cannot, cannot, without getting emotional, thank the staff and the NHS above all for all that they did. All that stuff, all that expertise was all for free. And the food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I, I think you, I start to realise what, you know, that every day you live is... <laughs> It, honestly, just, just you got to cherish it. You really have. You had the whole of York and all your fans, oh, the pantomime it, fans, worried sick that yeah, day. Yeah, and yeah. For weeks afterwards. And then you weren't in the pantomime that year, but you yeah. were. You, you had a yeah, sort of yeah. a guest well, role. Well, well, just going back a little bit to that as well is... Um, uh, what, I mean, what, what my family and friends were going through, because I only... I only got cognizant of this, of when I was able to operate my mobile and see properly, uh, the Facebook and all the messages. And it, it came to like 1,200 odd. I, I just, it took hours to get through and thank and like every, every person. Um, I just, just pr sorry, prior to that, the, the very last bit of the recovery process or coming out of it was that uh, when my family and friends arrived at first on the day the accident had happened, uh, they said, right, we've got to explain this. At the moment, the machine is doing everything. 
for it, right? I mean, absolutely everything. There's a graph there, a monitor. Now, you see that green line there? Now, that's moving quite steadily because that's the monitor, that's the machine ticking over. What we're waiting for is a white line, and that's your dad. So we'll let you know when that happens. Anyway, about three weeks later, they said, right, could you get to Leeds as soon as possible? The white lines appeared on the monitor. He's, his fight for life has started. So they got over there and they rushed in and they said, right, you know there's only two people allowed in at, at that time. We have to say the lines disappeared. So, so right, said, well, can we wait? Anyway, it, they didn't have to wait that long. It was about 50 minutes and they said, come through, it's starting. The rise was so rapid that my lad said, it's like the Oxford Cambridge boat race. And I think dad's going to win it. And it's, it, you know, faltered a bit at times there. And then it drew level. And then, uh, then it overtook the line, my life. And they said, right, he's out of danger. We can now, and we're confident he's out of danger. We can switch, start to switch items off. Like that. So, yeah, it was, so when I came out of hospital, I stayed at my best mates from drama school, Gordon and his wife, Sue. They were, they were absolutely brilliant, making sure I got my medication every day as well. Oh. <laughs> he actually said to me, oh boy, you don't know how much I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Ruling my best mate. <laughs> Come on, chop, chop. Time to take these tablets and these tablets. So I was still really thin really frail uh, I couldn't eat a lot of food in a hospital not because it was bad it was I, I thought it was great I just didn't feel like eating when your stomach shrinks you know mm. you just all you want to do is sleep and um, so they said would you come and uh, do some filming for the panto the famous panto film uh, I've just tell the listeners that it began in about 2002 that Beric said instead of doing a front cloth scene where there's a routine marching soldiers let's have a movie a home movie and the more home movie it is the better the more charming it is so let's do that uh, and of course it means the public of York get to see all their surroundings uh, they get to see themselves in it maybe uh, there's different areas used we've used Malton we've used Scarborough as well but it's, it's particularly in this area of the country they get to see and uh, would you be part of the filming I said yeah. I said I look I look really thin I, are you sure they said no, honestly we, it really will be quite something so, anyway, what it was, was there's meant to be a Rocky Horror theme to it. And they say, right, uh, uh, Rocky's been rejuvenated. Ah, here he comes now. So they had a body double uh, of a very big, muscular, like mummy, all bandages. <laughs> and then it cut to a close-up of me with the bandages being undone, and it's my face. And... Boy, I was just so, I was just absolutely burst in tears. It was just so incredible. Uh, I was really enjoying that. And then Jude, our lovely production manager, she'd said, Martin, I hope you're enjoying it. I went, yeah, it's, it's fantastic, but bizarre sitting here watching the York Theatre Royal Panto. I've always just been in it. And they said, uh, Barry just wondered if you'd come down to the wings. I went, what for? No, just, just, just you want to maybe get a better view of the whole show and all like that. I didn't realise that at the very end of the song sheet, he came on with a life-size carrot with my face in it because I've, in many years, been singing the carrot song. <laughs> How many carrots in my garden? How many carrots can you see? And he gets, he gets more and more manic, manic, you know, How many carrots? So, uh, so that's what I'm kind of known for, carrot man in a way. Anyway, he said, uh, we've got uh, this uh, working model of Miss Sun here, but actually we've gone one better tonight because we've got the lad here himself. You, you must bring me on stage and of course it, I'm not being funny about this but when you suddenly become a member of the public and because you know you know show backwards you know what looks to give and everything like that I became just like a, a member of the public on, a, on a, a contestant in a quiz show it was like hi everyone like that and I couldn't believe it and everybody stood up <sighs> Oh, it was just, it was, and it just wouldn't stop clapping. It was just absolutely astonishing. It really was. And uh, yeah, and Beric said, he looked at me, he's a swine at times. He just looked over, he said, You crying? And I thought, He said that to me when he offered the part all oh, 30 odd years ago. And uh, I said, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm off again. You know, <laughs> set me off, you've done it. Um, and then, as we went off into the wings, I said, thanks for that, Beric. Thank you so much. Uh, and he said, right, you're coming on for the walk down, right? And you're the last to come on. I said, 
No. No. In all the years I've been doing pantomime, no matter how quirky the panto is, you're always the last to come on in the big frock. He said, I want you to come on last. So that, you know, I, I know it might not sound a lot, but in theatrical terms, it's wow. It's, it's gold medal, you know, Olympics. <laughs> the audience reaction, though. I, I remember when you were, when you came down that, that, let's start that bit again. I remember when you appeared on the video, the cheers oh, and yeah, the roars, yeah, yeah. and oh, it was yeah, just oh, wonderful. Oh. The public just loved seeing you back. Well, well it, it, I mean, you know, it's the you, people in the street, they stop you, they, you know, and, and people just, what is it? This? Oh, and when they say, you know, uh, um, oh, we booked for January the 17th, uh, but we'll begin the, the Nana, the kids, of course, you know, well, I say kids, they're now 27 and 29. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, and I've never heard of a production before where someone says they've booked today and they go, oh, oh one other thing, what is it this year? They've booked not even knowing what the title is, you know. It's, uh, but I, I remember um, uh, on an interview, I, I, had, I, I did a podcast with Richard Herring for the Yorkshire Fringe uh, like two years ago. And he said, uh, so do, do you have any story? I mean, you know, 34 years, 35 years, have you ever had any rows with Berry? And he said to us. I said, well, Beric has told the audience, he said, we've been together all this time, we've never had a row. And I've just said, that's because I'm scared to death of you. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives me that look as if that wasn't the correct answer. <laughs> there was, I've got to tell you this, we're doing Aladdin some years ago and uh, Abenaza has cast the spell where all our wealth, all our riches, and uh, even the clothes we stand up in all disappear. So, of course, that's, you know, going towards the end of the first half. So it means when we next appear, it's a really good setup. Oh, here the twankies come now. Oh, my, what? like that. So what Beric had written is that uh, I come in in a giant Sainsbury's bag to spare my blotches. <laughs> he comes on with a, a barrel uh, and uh, braces to hide his blotches. So the, uh, the supposition is that we have nothing on underneath, you know. But being pantomime, mine's a giant sense for his bag, he's a giant barrel. Uh, so my, my line is simply, oh, girls and boys, you'll never guess what. It's true. All our riches, all our wealth, so even the clothes we stand up in. So that was that. And it got, you know, I think the costumes got a decent reaction. We were in the wings, and I said, we're just about to go on. We've been open about a week. I said, very, very We've just got part of time. I've got a fantastic line. Oh, come on, I know about your fantastic lines. I said, what about the omnibus edition of Dick Whittington, huh? Still haven't paid me for that. I'll give you a hug. <laughs> look, look, I've got... He said, come on, what's this line? What's this line? I'll see if it's any good. Right, you know I come on, I say, hello, girls and boys. All our wealth... He says, yes, I know that. What's... Right, you've seen the uh, Del Monte adverts? He said, no. I said, You've got... you have seen the Del Monte the Del Monte advert. What's Del Monte? Oh, what do you eat in your household? <laughs> it's fruit, right? Okay, Del Monte. Right. The man from Del Monte is the, like, orange, orangery boss. So he is, in orange growing, he's the god. So he tastes an orange, and they all wait, because if the crop fails this year and it's no good, then they're all impoverished. Otherwise, if it's a yes, celebration time. So in, in every advert, it's gone. Mm. He nods. The man from Del Monte, he say yes. And everyone cheers, hats in the air. And he says, Barry goes, what's that got to do with Aladdin? I said, right, right. So if I come on, get, let the costumes get their laugh, right? You look to me, I look to you, and I say, girls and boys, the man from Del Monte, he say no. And he just looked at me stony-faced. He said, we've got about 18 seconds before we go on stage. Look, Martin... I love you to bits, but what you've got to learn about all comedy, and especially pantomime, not every line is funny. Sometimes it's a feed line. Sometimes it's an information line. I say, yeah, but the thing is, they've laughed at the costume. Yes, we're, like, kind of naked under here and all like that, and that's the humour of that. But then when you open your mouth, you, you, as an audience, you're going, well, I hope this is going to be a funny line. But I'm just telling them that, yes, our clothes have disappeared. He said, well, that's, it's, a, it's a corker of a line. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I'll say the line if you like. I went, well, no, don't take the line away from me, you know. <laughs> well, just say the line. So people walking by, stage crew, going, they're having a right set to me. I've never, never seen them argue. 
because <laughs> Martin's too scared of him. Um, but he's fighting his corner, and he's and he's. So I, I gave up. I thought, right, all right. It was it was an idea. I just thought I was thinking outside the box that it might be funny. Anyway, so we go on stage. I come on in a giant carry bag. It gets really big laugh. Uh, he comes on in the barrel of the braces. You know, equally big laugh like that. And then suddenly his hand stretches out and he clamps it over my mouth, and he goes, girls and boys, the man from Del Monte. He said no. <laughs> And it gets this massive laugh and a round of applause. <laughs> Beric then just looks at me, takes the hand away from my mouth and goes, do you know, son, I don't know how I think of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then Beric, being Beric, he totally said, right, I'll put him out of his misery. About a minute ago, we were in the wings there and they explained the whole story. And that's because he's a fantastic storyteller. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, and there was uh, uh, just one other I've got to tell you this of about course. Beric being on stage <laughs> and nothing escapes Beric nothing at all our drummer uh, Danny is absolutely superb drummer a bit of a workaholic as well because he does concerts on a Sunday night he's always travelling got great car and all like that anyway it was a Friday night and we've got two shows the next day the Saturday this is about six years ago and he said Martin um, are you you're not, you're not for a drink after the show or anything? I said, I'm not. Look, with two shows tomorrow, I'm, I'm really a bit jiggered. He said, right, I've just had a call. Uh, a mate reminding him that he's coming to York and he's going out for drinks. It's his birthday. Oh, right. Would you, it's a big favour to ask. Would you mind driving my car? It's in a small car park. I was at opposite theatre. And I think the nearest place where there's no restrictions or lines is... Uh, I said, it's Booth and Crescent, York football ground. I said, that's where I park my car. Uh, well, if you wouldn't mind... Uh, I said, well, it's, it's a quarter of a mile from the theatre. Da, 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 there, boom, crescent there, and I'll get in my, I'll leave it there overnight. Yeah. He said, the reason is, is that the car parking charges start at half past eight in the morning. I don't have to get up, you know, if I get up at half eight. I don't have to get up, then start putting money in. The easiest option is if you could, because my mate's there now, actually, and I'm going to meet him. He's come quite a long way from London. I went, listen, Danny, Danny, right, just give me the keys and like that. So we're in the car park. I said, oh, Danny, Danny, before we go any further, i just got to check the, uh, so the lights and the indicator, that's the, because obviously I don't know what this car is. So it's all like that. Bye, Danny, enjoy your night, right? And I'm going home for an early night. So I came out the corner and I noticed these big white lights. I thought, oh dear, it says police backwards on it. That is a police van. So they indicate me to pull into just where Radio York is. I mean, literally 80 yards I'd travelled. Right, excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, you're the uh, owner of this vehicle. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not. There's a good reason that my mate Danny, I do the pantomime here, at which point he looked at me and went, oh, no, you don't. I went, ah, it's not quite the time. But I'm in mm. the right. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a favour. So I'm doing a big favour. I'm just reparking his car. His name's Danny. Uh, he works at the theatre with me as well. Uh, and I just thought I'd park it at uh, Booth and Crescent. That's where my car is. I said, yeah, right, we'll just check with Swansea. Uh, you, you're not insured. I said, no, but Danny would be insured for me to drive it. That's not the case. And in subsequent weeks, I've been telling people this story, and they said, yeah, but if you've got fully comp insurance, then it would cover you for that. I said, it wouldn't cover me for someone else's car. I'd have to take out separate... Anyway, they kept me there for an hour and a half, and uh, it was a, there was a trainee uh, policeman there as well, jotting everything down. I think, had there not been a trainee there, he would have said, right, okay, leave the car where it is, Danny will have to see to it, blah, blah, blah. But they kind of threw the book at me. Anyway, then I contacted Danny, and he was having a great time, you know, until I said I've got some really bad news. And the cars had to be put in the pound, and, uh, and they're not open on Saturdays or Sundays. So it's gonna have to be in the pound for three days at 85 pounds a day. Uh, I then end up getting six points on my licence. I mean, unbelievable. Thankfully, my licence was clean. But six points for three years, you know. Mm. Two to quid fine, something like that. So, anyway, we we meet in the morning, have breakfast and everything, and the mood is extremely sombre. And we do the show. Both of us looking quite sheepish. And uh, Beric comes on. He starts doing those things bit, and he said, do you know what, do you mind if we just ditch this this bit of dialogue at the moment. Danny there, what car do you drive? I'm going, 
no, no. How, no, how was Beric found out? He, he's, he's, you won't believe this. Beautiful car he's got there. Martin doesn't know how to drive it there, so he checks with Danny, the lights are like that. Danny's there with all his mates, knees up low the bra. There, there's Martin there, an hour and a half, with the police. Tell them why you're with the police. I, <laughs> I thought the car was insured with Danny, but it, 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 it wasn't anything like that. So, from the rest of the, he just gave us pure hell. He really did, but he, Beric being Beric, he got real positive gags out of it. Every time I come on stage, he went, now then, Krim, how are you doing? It's the Jailbirds band. <laughs> it was like, oh, please. So it was, it, what, I know it sounds quite grave circumstances, but it was the simplest of mistakes. If I'd have uttered those words, Danny, you insured for me to do this. You are insured. And he'd gone, oh, I didn't think. I said, well, I can't help you, I'm afraid. Then I wouldn't have had those points. So I'm chatting to a felon tonight. Oh, felon. felon. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> felon. You speak about Beric in, with such a smile and yes, such my, affection. And obviously last year yeah. he announced his retirement. How did you take that? Oh, he's, I was in bits. I mean, he's my absolute hero because he does comedy... I think I think it's weird I should say this actually because in the early 80s I stayed uh, with a real theatrical landlady she was fantastic she wore like a Demis Roussos smock with a badge saying I am seven on it <laughs> and I think they, 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 were, they were about 32 pounds a week with tea and coffee included I thought that's for me <laughs> uh, and Beric used to stay there as well it was down Markham Crescent off Haxby Road and posters everywhere, theatrical posters. And one, I said, uh, oh, God, that's a show I wish I'd have seen. Hancock's Last Half Hour. And she said, oh, you know, did that. We starred in it at Harrogate Theatre. Beric, did he? So next time I saw him, I said, you were a fan of Hancock? He went, oh, absolutely adore. It's this, and I think Richard Bean writes the same way, as the same way that Beric Kayla writes, the same way that John Gobber writes, is that kind of undercutting where the, you can't re quite read the punchline that's coming. Sometimes, I think with gags, you go, yeah, I kind of know where this is heading. You hear the punchline, you think, yeah, but I like the way it's told, or it's a good choice of words. But sometimes there's so left field, you're going, whoa, I didn't really expect that. And it's the unsentimentality. I think you can have empathy with, you know, audience, but I think if you start playing up to the, oh, me miserum, I feel so sad, uh, it can be a bit cloying. And I think, I think actors like uh, Beric, uh, directors like Damien Croon, they steer away from that. Um, I, I've just finished doing the play Brassed Off at Stoke Theatre, the New Vic, and Conrad Nelson, there's a speech at the end of the Royal Albert Hall where uh, my character, the Pete Postlethwaite part, uh, Danny, has come from hospital in his pyjamas almost, uh, on his deathbed, to receive the award. And he says, we're going to refuse it now uh, because our pit's closed. Uh, over the past 10 years, this government has systematically destroyed an entire industry, our industry, communities, and it's really tearful. And uh, at the very early on in rehearsals, Conrad, who I trust is a fantastic director, he said, Martin, I know what you're doing and I trust you implicitly. I wouldn't look for the, I wouldn't look for the sadness in it. The sadness is the end result of what you're telling us, that these pit closures. Uh, by all means, at the end of the speech, go, which I did start to because it's such an emotional speech. But he said, I would not play that too early on there because I know all the is going, oh, this is going to be a sad speech. And yeah, I can tell now. What I tried to do is delay any emotion in it to almost the final line, and then audience thinking, oh my, it's just been facts, that's all. And therefore, I think you're not fishing for it, you're not looking for it. And Hancock, in the same way that Les Dawson, that, you know, that lugubrious, oh, well, you know, I think, I think it just works so well. And it's a kind of, as the British people, we like to complain, but... You know, we'll say something to the waiter then. Oh, no, 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 no. Whereas in the States, hey, waiter, that's, this isn't right. Could you take it away and give me one, you know. It's like the, what is it? the guy says, this chicken, look at the state of it. Oh, it was in a fight, sir. So bring me the winner. <laughs> <laughs> but the affection you have for Beric is just... Yeah, he, especially on that last night as well. It, just... I was I was absolutely dreading it because uh, you know I just gave him the hug of hugs, and he, he I don't know what it is those big piercing blue eyes the it 
I mean, I, 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 th this is what he means to me, is that, uh, and when I tell this story, he'll be sitting and go, you're getting it wrong. You're getting all the facts wrong there. I say, what? I'm not exaggerating enough. He said, hey, less of that. So what happened was, the first panto we ever did here, 1977, I think it was maybe Cinderella or something like that, and uh, he said the script was, was absolutely abysmal. It would have been touted around many, many theatres. It, it's, its nod to York was, I was walking down, and then it would have a dash, insert a street name, you know, whereas the panto is written for York primarily and North Yorkshire, uh, but it's like a national institution a national local institution and uh, so anyway I said well, so what, what did you do he said well you like this he said uh, I started ad living like crazy but only on the third night he said the first night I tried a York accent which was dreadful I mean terrible uh, so I just went to Sunderland you know that seemed to work that seemed to take me you know and uh, so I said well, what, what, what did you start saying then well he said the set was so terrible, it was just I made a paper, rice paper. I mean, not intentionally to walk through anything, that at one point I just punched a hole through the set and said, uh, look at this, absolutely no expense spared on this set, is there? Then he grabbed someone's uh, hand and said, uh, oh look, it's a stage hand. And, and it went on like this, and, and anyway. Next morning, uh, Michael Winter, the director, Right, uh, we'll have a meeting at 10 o'clock. Right, OK, chorus, dancers, good. We'll have been looking at polish up some of the numbers there. Uh, the tempo of the music, can you keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Beric, what I saw last night is the most unprofessional... He wouldn't give the word in professional out. Beric picked up his briefcase and he said, I'm out of here. I'm going back to my digs in Chiswick, OK? So I'll get whatever train is next. Thank you. It hasn't really been a pleasure. And walked out. And we're like, our, our dame has just resigned. Anyway, it was snowing like crazy at the time. And these same digs I was at where the Tony Hancock poster, uh, he came back through the door and she said, uh, you've only been gone 20 minutes. He said, yeah, I've resigned. Well, you, resigned? Yeah. Uh, she said, oh, you better have a cup of tea then. So he said, I sat myself by the gas fire. It was before breakfast telly was on those days, so I think he just put Radio 2 on. Anyway, he's there, get himself all settled, bitterly cold outside, snowing like crazy. Anyway, there's a <coughs> knock on the door. Who's this at this time? Opens the door. It's all the top brass of York Theatre Royal. It's uh, Michael Winter. It's the production manager. It's the chief executive, Nick Walsh, lovely guy. Uh, it's about five of them, all in the snow. Is, is, uh, is, is Beric there? And she said, I'm not sure. I'll have to have a look. Right, shuts the door, tells Beric this. He said, make him wait another two minutes. <laughs> so, like, there's, there's, he's getting more and more insistent. And then eventually, yes, he'll see you now. So he's there. I said, did you get up or anything? He went, did I get up? I just sat there. So they said, Beric, Beric. We've been very, very foolish about this. We, we know the script is absolutely appalling. It really is terrible. We, we were, in a way, clinging to power of, you know, a director tells an actor what to do. I'm afraid that's reversed because you, you were magnificent last night. Why we didn't tell you that, we, we don't even know. What we're saying is, please, please stay on and please will you write next year's. And it's going, I can't even write the check, man. Uh, well, I'll, you know, and uh, I think he does himself down there, but that was how it was. And you see, it's that intransigence of going, when you know something's good, when you know it's absolutely great. Uh, I'm, I'm too soft. I'm, in a way, a bit daft of, oh, well, I'll be the nice guy. And I'll put... Beric has standards which are so high. Everything that he says or gets in a bit of a strop about, as he has occasionally. Um, but it will be for the good of the show. It will always be for the quality, quality of the show. And uh, I'm trying to persuade him like crazy to, to return and to not retire. Um, because I think he is... I think he's just a born performer. Uh, he's also a born writer. You know, the stuff he gives you to, to, to write there. I think one of the finest lines ever written for a villain was this one. David Leonard, I oh, couldn't believe it. He was like, I'm the villain. Yes, remember me? Oh, come on, you must remember me. The villain on the booze, permanently hissed. <laughs> and you think that is clever. 
that so so clever and so um, panto so panto perfect perfect panto uh i remember one year beric said uh listen can i ask a favor um i had a lot of tv work this 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 year and i said yeah i've i've seen uh he said no no but the, the, the point is um look we're like best mates aren't we our sense of humor is the same could you write a few scenes and yeah I'd love to. No one's really given me the chance. So it was the Millennium pantomime, Old Mother Millie. And David Leonard uh, had this thing about the million bugs. Everything will grind to a halt. It was all so erotic, quite poetically. And Dave thought it was great, everything like that. And I said, yeah. So I'd have written for him, I said, in short, there'll be a kind of hush all over the world. And all the audience went, tonight. <laughs> And it was, so I wrote that, I wrote another slapstick scene, uh, and then me and my wife wrote uh, uh, Melba number one, instead of uh, Mambo number one. Oh, number five, sorry. Yeah, Melba number five, instead of Mambo number five. And it contained 37 different types of fruit. And it was all, it, but it was real chatty and, you know, jangly and all like that. And when we got the review in the York Press, Charles Hutchinson said, the Melba number five song was absolute panto. It was a joy to listen to. I thought, what? I must be doing something right there. So, but I think, per honestly, the, it, it, it's all rubbed off on me to, from Berwick. If I'd not met Berwick, I wouldn't be half the person I am. And he's taught me about clarity, about focus, what the main laugh is, how to get a second laugh, how not to lose the laugh, but that's one of the worst things. Suddenly it's always gone down well, and you're going, what's happening now, you know? But woe betide, anyone's, when you have a main gag, or anyone who is pulling focus or moving, because that is messy. An audience won't thank you for it. They'll go, oh, am I meant to be watching? Um, obviously, it's a director's job, but very co-directs as well, so he's got that. But you're in the safest possible hands. And, uh, and I remember... Oh, very early in the uh, days where I, I thought, I'm going to have a bit of a go at this ad-libbing business. So I thought I'd fill in, basically. So <clears throat> what happened was, is that he'd been suspended over a tank of water, he'd been dunked into it, I was getting custard pies from an automatic dishwashing machine. <laughs> he then had to go through a false door and appear at the top, coming down all these steps. Uh, anyway, as he did come down all these steps, he just looked back, shouted at a stage crew and saying, oh, cheers, Bill. Yeah, more water than usual this afternoon. Look at me, I'm absolutely... And as he's walking, I mean, normally, the well, wellies are a bit, you know, uh, squishy. But the water was coming right over the tops as he was walking down the stairs. So I thought I'd just ad-lib this moment. And I went, hey, <laughs> that's gravity for you. <laughs> and he went, sorry, did you say something? I went, that's gravity, the... Why the waters are all going over the edge of you? Oh, by now I was feeling like I'm dying. <laughs> I know this isn't funny at all. I don't even know why I said it. And he said, "So the what? The gravity makes the water go over the wellies." He said, yeah, what? "Right, come here." Now he pretended as if we're in our sort of just your own living room, as if you're going into the corner of a room. <laughs> of course, you're facing a thousand people. Listen, son, um, you know what you just said about is it gravity? I went, "Yeah." Yeah, it's gravity. And that's what makes the water go onto the floor from the tops of the wellies. I said, in short, that's it. Yeah, yeah. He said, listen, just a bit of advice here, son. You know when you do an ad-lib? Make it funny. <laughs> now, the thing is, it's a twofold thing. People who have told a story to, they've gone, you must have felt like dying. I said, no, 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 no. Both people are getting their laughs. I'm getting the sympathy, like, leave the lad alone. But getting peals of laughter from Berwick. So it's that put-upon thing that works really well. Like Stan being shoved by Ollie, you know. You're going, oh, you know. But sure enough, Ollie will get his ego pricked because of his pomposity, you know. Things work in different ways, and when you see the mechanics of it... Um, I know Richard Bean, uh, you know, fantastic comic writer, as well as serious, but... Um, he said uh, a good a good thing when you first get a script or a script of mine is put an L next to every time you think it's a line that might get a laugh. And I've never done that before. You've just gone, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll get it, move it about on stage and like that. But you think, right, I'm actually doing my homework here. And that helps at the read-through to give an intonation of 
you know, there's a punchline coming up or I'm setting this gag up for you. Um, years ago, Berwick said he worked at the Windmill Theatre in the West End. Was it We Never Close? And he was working with this well-known comic. Uh, Berwick was playing the feed. Uh, the well-known comic, he won't tell me who it was. Still won't. And, uh, but anyway, what happened was is that one of the best gags in the show, it didn't get a laugh or it hardly got anything. And uh, as we were going back to the dressing room, he said uh, to the guy, he said, that gag about the kippers or whatever, it didn't, didn't get uh, much of a laugh. He said, you know why? You didn't feed me properly. He went, I didn't, what? He said, you weren't clear with the lines. I said, really? And from that moment has stuck with him. It's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but that's again a case of losing a laugh, which is like deadly to a comic actor, you know, because you think, what am I doing, what am I wrong? So it, just a, another quick example of that, and it's another visual one. In One Man, Two Governors, again, we're on Brighton Pier. Now, one of the characters, the, the, uh, the sort of Harlequin figure, the, the, the uh, no good boyo, uh, he says, he calls me over, he says, right, Alfie, Alfie, yes, what? Because obviously my hearing's going, uh, Alfie, right. There's a magazine here for Mallorca, right? Yes, I can see that, yes. Magazine for Mallorca. Give this to Dolly, right, who lives nearby. Give this to Dolly and she'll know what you mean. So what it is, is I'm proposing marriage to you. And I've often hinted that a honeymoon spot, a lovely spot is Mallorca. So as soon as she sees that, it's will you marry me? So my character, all I'm being told is I have to give this brochure. So right here, I'll be off then. And then I go off, full sexy, come back, I go, oh, I will I recognise this dolly? So the character says, oh, that's easy. And he does, if you can visualise this, he does very big boobs sign with his hands. So my character then goes, she's got arthritic hands. <laughs> Which gets the most fantastic laugh. Now, one night, you know sometimes you're speaking and you see presenters, a oh, bit of a, just like a bit of a glitch in the voice. Mm. Got one just then. I happened to get one on that very line. So instead of running it together like, she's got arthritic hands, like that, I went, she's got arthritic hands. And it suddenly gets this much, much bigger laugh. It's like 85% of the audience, but previously, were laughing and loving it. And this was 100%. Because I think sometimes with lines, you go, well, yeah, everyone understands she's got arthritic hands like that. Because you've missed the H off, it's just not quite as clear as it could be. So that absolute clarity means that people at the back going, sorry, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 he, he, he said hands, yeah, yeah, I get other gestures and all like that. This is where occasionally... I remember I had to take a school assembly once reading a poem and this, and it was our drama teacher who, who gave me advice. She said, because you're trying to appeal to everyone with this poem, which is quite obscure, imagine everybody are five-year-olds, right? Not patronising, but the clarity and don't hurry it, don't... Obviously, it can't all go as slowly as that. But the, the lines that need to be zhizhed up or made absolutely clear, just underline them. Just go through it. I mean, in a way, that's your homework. Do that, and a director will sit there in the chair. Next day, you come on to it, and they go, wow, you, you, the speech is coming on. You really worked on that. That's great. Because I can't tell you everything to do, and I certainly can't tell you how to act. You've just got to rely on your instincts a lot. And I think, you know, the, the best actors to work with are instinctive actors, uh, which again comes back to Beric. Uh, I mean, Beric told me about his upbringing. It was, it's... It really, it's impoverished, absolutely impoverished. Gathering sea coal on the beaches at, uh, and Sunderland, uh, that sea coal, so they could keep warm. And lots of brothers and sisters. His dad left home when he was about uh, four or five. His mum died just before Christmas when he was about 10. So he was orphaned and he was taken in by his elder brother who had just got married. Uh, 18 and I think his bride was 18 as well and uh, he said I lived there for 6-7 years otherwise I would have nowhere to live you know absolutely so uh, he became very self made about this and decided to be a painter and decorator I think because he figured I'd be good at it 
I've got a good eye for these things, and people will always want people and decorators, always. So uh, he went down to London, and I think he, I don't know where he stayed in London, but he was 16 years old, went to London, and the actor, film actor, uh, Lawrence Harvey, who by then was a, becoming a very big film star, chisel good looks and everything, and had this fancy house in South Kensington, and uh, he chatted day after day with Berwick, and he said, you know, I think you should become an actor. I don't just mean, you know, we've had a joke, and I, I don't just mean a comic, but actually an actor, because you've got that kind of bearing and, you know, a truthfulness as well, which, which you know, you, you get from Tony Hancock, Wes Dawson, whatever. Uh, you've got that truthfulness, which, which is not trying to overly impress. Um, and I think that's... That, that's set him on the road you know it's it's giving that compliment from someone that you know you'd admired watching his movies saying that i think you've actually got it so that's where we are yeah for you personally would you ever like to explore the baddie role it's funny because i've uh, you know, in plays i've i think i've only twice played a baddie and one was a crooked manager of a beatles type duo um, a really nasty piece of work and that was quite enjoyable because I think if you watch almost any episode of EastEnders uh, there will be <laughs> villains who play it so softly uh, so confidently a uh, little smile um, now, it's funny because in, in, as pantomime it's a really good question this and once that I, I've never been asked before ever thank you <laughs> pleasure <laughs> is that in a slapstick scene I remember there was um a, a bit where I had to come on and Beric said, well, when the villain arrives, what on earth is he going to say? And I just went into villain mode, the way David Lennon does it, mm. with, uh, as if he's directing traffic, you know, <laughs> right arm up, left arm sideways, and ha, 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 yes. <laughs> and uh, giving it sort of cross between Kenneth Williams and um, some of the plummy actor as well. Uh, but I've not, I mean, we do, we do play each other's roles occasionally, like every so often, I mm. mean, like every few years, where Susie Cooper does an impersonation of Beric. Uh, I, this last year, I, I did, a, 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 I'm playing Beric's mother. <laughs> so I was talking like that all the time, like you know, and <laughs> doing this very stilted. <laughs> and it was great because Beric said to me, uh, this year just gone, he said, you know one of the best bits of the show I enjoy is when me and you are playing mother and daughter. <laughs> I said, I know, because he would talk like that and I'd talk, so it was the most unreal, surreal piece of dialogue <laughs> and very unpantomimic. It was just like talk in lines on a page. Uh, and he, he just got a reaction, you know, it was really good. Um, David's done... Uh, when he was turned from a baddie into a goodie uh, the year before last, he came out in Beric's wig and the dress. I makes me burns, I love you so all, you know? So we do have that kind of thing, and that's a lot of fun doing that, too. Um, but no, I can't... I, I, I don't know. It would be interesting to see your take as a baddie. It would, it would. And it, it's such a skillful thing. You know, I mean, you're on stage with Davy Leonard, who, again, is the master you know, absolute best villain in the country. Uh, I mean, across, I tell him, you know, I tell people he's a cross between, uh, you know, Noah Coward, Kenneth Williams and Rocky Horror Show, you know, all in one. And so inventive. I mean, I had this scene last year and I tell my kids, I have never been on stage where I've laughed so much. And that was the dentist. The dentist, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> being, and being so close to such a master <laughs> of delivery. I mean, it was just the list of items in the book, you know, they just differ every night. It was just, uh, well, um, Paul Daniels' wig, uh, <laughs> let's have a look here. Yeah, yeah. It meant to be a medical dictionary. <laughs> and it's been all these things, you know, hat stands. And, the um, thing is, though, the audience can tell you are absolutely oh, having a blast. And we can oh, tell a, a, yeah. a, a real corpse from a cog corpse. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny because at first I thought, right, it, what you don't want to do anyway is start uproarious laughter once you've sat in the dentist's chair because he hasn't done anything funny at that moment so truthfully and then it would just you see I've never I've never ever in my life been out of control on stage apart from perhaps moments where 
there is like great sadness in the, the, the play Laurel and Hardy, where Oliver Hardy is, uh, it's a bit difficult to describe this, the writing is in di diagonal, uh, like sometimes is it E. Cummings, the poet, would write without capital letters, but in different shapes of words. And uh, so when the actor was, uh, he asked uh, Damien, uh, why, he said, well, I, I went to the Royal uh, Scottish College of Dramatic Art with uh, John La, and he said, uh, I know exactly what he means there. He means it's falling cadences. So it's like you're getting iller and iller and iller. And then you'll see what happens on the next page. So it was a fantastic device where I talked about um, uh, I'd, I'd retired. Um, they, they'd sort of retired because of ill health. But Stan actually came back to health and passed away in the late 60s. But Ollie died, was in hospital for a year, paralyzed for a really sad. Anyway, to go back to the play, it says uh, liver, kidney, heart, lung. This big, fat old body of, me, a body of mine is just packing in. But then, then you turn the page and it says what they want the effect is that the spotlight is on his face and it's going smaller and smaller and smaller, as he says, but my job is to make people, he does the tie twiddle and it does just a pin shot on the tie being twiddled, laugh, bang, and that's it. Well. I tried as best I could every night because uh, that then my, I follow that with because it's just blackness and I'm sat on a trunk there saying how I was just too sad to go to Ollie's funeral which is true he, he just couldn't bring himself to he was too frail anyway um, to do it so I mean on the last night I remember of doing that the guy playing Ollie there there was just you know tears streaming down his face as he's coming to that moment my job is to make people tie twiddle laugh blackness and it was like and I thought I'm out of control I'm out of control I mean yes it's good to use it for the character and perhaps people who are sitting there go I can see that actor is really absolutely in bits mm. because of what's been said and I hope that is the truth but on a much much sunnier side and opposite side being next to David Leonard just a few inches away not knowing what on earth is going to come out <laughs> of that mouth of his uh, or how long for uh, we're just, you know, and I'm dressed as Captain Hook. I've got the black wig on. I've got the hook there. You know, there's nothing to do. I can't do anything. And that was the, that was the best bit. Why I think it works so well is I was trapped in the dentist chair. I couldn't move away. I just had to sit there and go for. There were times when I was having difficulty breathing. You know, when you you can't, you just can't get the breath. And David would know that. You I mean, would literally pay to be in that seat. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, when I first met David Leonard, again, going back to the digs where the Tony Cat Tank poster was, sorry, poster, uh, the landlady said, oh, we've got a tall boy in here. He's doing panto. I'm not sure what part, but it's very tall. So I knocked on the door and it was David Leonard. I said, are you, are you doing a panto? He said, yeah, yeah, what, what are you doing? He said, villain. I said, I'm an idiot son, yeah. Uh, didn't go for a beer, you know. Uh, so I said, yeah, I'll see you in about 10 minutes. Well, we are walking into town, about a 10 minute walk. Within those 10 minutes, he was doing an impersonation of the landlady, which is what he puts into the part as well. Struth! What time you call this? Uh, and she'd always be saying Struth, you know, real character. Um, but I, I realised, as soon as David opened his mouth in the read-through, me trying a Geordie accent, but him doing it perfectly. And of course it's like, oh, you, yeah. so, like Kenneth Williams, uh, which he admits to. And that's uh, delicious because it's easy to get booze uh, as a villain, the way I see it, and to be nasty. But they've got to like you as well. Mm. Uh, and that's a very simplistic way of putting it. Or it's whichever way you find of them liking. But you will have your moments. I mean, usually when, as Abanaza, it's about the lamp. Has to, now that has to be done for real. There are moments where Beric says, like a transformation scene, there should be no gags in it, no no real comedy. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, pumpkin transformed into Cinderella's coach. Just abate the laughter. We want to watch something that is gorgeous. And I remember when David has sung the about getting that the lamp has to be there somewhere, and it's just like watching a Western musical. 
because all his passion he puts into it. So for the time being, you just lay aside the, the gags. And there's, you know, there is a time for every flavor of entertainment. And that's why I think, when I've said to people, and when I do drama workshops in schools and colleges, I honestly believe if you can do panto, you can do anything. Certainly comedy-wise, uh, and even, I don't know, serious. But the thing is, what I tell most students is, right, my problem is, and I'll be honest with you, is that it's volume, okay? If I can't hear you, I don't get it, right? Now, if you're too loud, I I'll let you know. I don't think any time in the near future, and I'm not being horrible, I'm just saying, I don't think at any time in the near future I was saying, you're too loud there, you really are. Just belt it out, because you can always bring it back. When I first went to drama school, I was told, you're a bit sotto voce. Believe it or not, I, I, I really, I thought that what I was doing, like TV acting, was enough, and it's not. The trick is, in any theatre, is that you get the, uh, you treat the back wall as a resounding board. So if you hear that slight echo, just a, even on a quiet line, you know you've been heard by the person who probably booked last uh, and is at the very back there. So I said, Let, let's practice that. And I, through working your voice, as a, treating it as, as a tool, is I've been told what a big gob I've got. And I know I have got a very, very loud voice. Um, so, and that's a compliment because, you know, there's nothing worse than, you see, if you, if, like the line about uh, arthritic hands, if you can't hear that, or she's got oh, arthritic hands, you're, oh, sorry, it, it, it looks funny what he was saying, but I just didn't get mm. it at all. So every time it's clarity of intention, and, oh, how is it not my dressing room call? I'm, <laughs> I'm not even in this show. <laughs> It's only, what, four months away? It's only four months <laughs> yeah. away, and it's small as an Amazon, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that can't be emphasised enough. And I do love doing uh, drama workshops, because in, in the space of about two hours, I say, right, OK, let's... You might not like comedy, but let's all tell a joke. So if you um, get into pairs... So, maybe start the joke, you can do your own joke, but a really good corny joke is this, and it's short, is... My dog's got no nose. Your dog's got no nose. How does it smell? Terrible. Okay, so that's the gag. So I say, right, you can tell it as a naturalistic way of like, a, oh, hi there. You know where my dog's, um, it's got no nose. No, how does it smell? Ooh, terrible. Or let's go the total opposite and make it musical. I say, I say, I say, <laughs> my dog has no nose. How does it smell? Terrible. <laughs> and then maybe a clap together and a stamp. So I say, right. All my drama workshops are about confidence. I know a lot of drama schools call it relaxation. And that gives the... That gives that... To, it's confidence. It's, I can go out there, I don't have nerves, or if I have nerves, I'll use them uh, as adrenaline. But I just want you to be really confident with a simple gag. Right, and let's do it, the gag. It might seem a bit tedious, but let's do it again and again and again until I'll say, right, right, I can totally hear you now. Because obviously a lot of people are shy. A lot of people who take drama workshop, they might not want to be actors, but they might say, but I love drama. And say, right, if you love it, I'll help you even more. Mm. Just be louder. Just work your diaphragm, work the vocal cords there, and it will happen. Um, and again, it's like being seen. Uh, you know, if you're hiding behind another character, you go, right, just come to the side there, so now everyone can see what you're doing. That's fine. That's not usually such a problem. Um, I would say it's, it's, it's vocalisation. And having the, I mean, when I do, I say, right, to our workshop, we'll do all different exercises, which are all to do with acting. I said, when I was about 17, there was a lot of absurd plays being written. And I'd hold my hand up and say, I don't know what they're about. I have the faintest idea what they're about. There were a lot of reruns of, uh, is it Play for Today's, that used to be on telly recently on Talking Pictures Channel. And you're looking, you're going, what was that? All, what was that all about? I, I, looked, I, I'm an actor. I speak English. They were speaking. I, I don't get. You know. The, so let's take a lot of the mystique away from acting. Acting is a job. You're wearing clothes that aren't your own usually, and you're speaking lines written by someone else usually. So let's cut away all, all that because I, I think a lot of people won't take drama school because they go oh it's all that kind of high for looting you know oh he has been with me and all. yeah there is that because it was written 400 years ago I mean Shakespeare didn't sit there and say right uh, listen I've written this 400 years time they're all going to be rolling in the aisles 
I think some of Shakespeare's lines are the unfunniest lines I've ever read in my life. <laughs> I mean, the, but the thing is, a lot of it's wordplay, which was hilarious then, because it was really good stuff, you know, then. But, um, so, yeah, they, 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 just this whole thing about confidence and, um, and say, right, We'll split up into groups of, say, four, five, thereabouts. Uh, we've done all these exercises. I've taught you a bit of comedy uh, uh, fight, fight direction as well. You know, the poke in the eye and all like that, which is actually just to the side of the ear. But to an onlooker, looks the, the stamp on the foot. So stuff that you might find in a comedy, the Lauren Hardy type slapstick. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, we'll do uh, a drinks commercial, like Milkshake, where we mime it. And uh, I remember one time, what I do is, if you can picture this, is say, right, we'll just be chatting away, I'll go one, two, three, and strike the most dynamic pose possible of grabbing uh, a tumbler of drink, like a milkshake, like a, and we'll go with it like that. Now, if you falter or you move or wriggle about a bit there, we're gonna go, I don't believe you've got a drink there. Right? If you look directly at it intently, we go, I believe it, and then you transfer the shape of it exactly as possible. I don't like that. Anyway, I remember I said, right, let's go one step further. So you're just chatting to your partner, walking about, and I'll say one, two, three, and then you all go, Shum! and say, right, and now we'll move the drink, and then we'll go, um, um, um. so it's a mime exercise, basically. So I did brainwave one time where I said, tell you what, let's go one further. We're going to play a trick on your teacher because I'm going to go to the staff room and complain about you lot, right? Because I can't teach you. You're unruly. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to stroke my eyebrow like that. As soon as I scratch it, you all just go, jump, and stop because you're all just chatting away like that. So I went to the staff room. I said, oh, you've got to have a word. We're a really good drama group. You've got to have a word. So I flung the door open there. She looked at everyone just like people giving me piggybacks, people having a bit of a scrap like that. I just went to my eyebrow and everyone leapt to their feet and went, jump. Like that, and it carried on there. So, and anyway, second half of the if it's a two hour drama workshop, right? I said at drama school, I used to love doing improvisation, I loved it, and there were some cracking improvisations five, ten minutes long. The only trouble is, is that that improvisation was never seen again, it would be a piece of work that was never worked on or anything like that. I said, when I was at drama school, there were some cracking little. 10 minute performances which you could work on enlarge you could write it as a play it's so good thinking on your feet and so what i'll do is one by one each group i'll give you a title like uh, the never-ending story or the ice cream that goes wrong or anything it can be as mad as you like or as serious as you like and uh, right once we've seen it right we'll see each group in turn and say right let's go back to the first group now we've got another 40 minutes i'll just pretend to be a director and I'll give you tips of how to get the best out of your improvisation. Right, and if you look at one of the performers and say, now you didn't have hardly anything to do there. Do you want more to do? Because I know the, the trouble with improvisation is very often the extrovert can get the best part. So if you're cool with not having to, or if you want, we'll expand your part. Okay, when you're doing that knock on the door there, make it a bit crisper. Imagine there actually is wood you're hitting against. Uh, loudness, volume, yeah, all these things. And say, right, I haven't got time to go through the whole improvisation with you, but that's the kind of thing we're aiming towards. So if I take you for a lesson again, we can get back to this. Next group, next group, next group. If there is time, if it's like two and a half hours, then you'll say, let's go through each one, the whole lot there. And I remember I went to a school about six months later, uh, and it was a lot of the very same class. And they said, oh, hey, sir, um, you know, about three weeks later, we worked and worked on all our improvisations, and we presented them in assembly. And they went bonkers for them. I said, well, that's great. And I said, it's all your work. No dialogue of me whatsoever. It's all what you produced. So I think when you do stuff like that, it's layers, confidence comes in layers. I mean, I, I was like, you know, country boy from Hull, Hull lad. I, I used to look around at the people in South Kensington at drama school and thought, how did I get here? How did I end up here? But we all think things like that. And then as I say, your confidence grows, people praise you, and you know, you're off. You look like you're still enjoying it. That's the main oh, thing. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It, you know, I, I, people say about learning lines. I love learning lines. I love it because you're in your room or whatever or you're on tour and you go, right, okay, cup of coffee there. Let's maybe, maybe look in the mirror, you know. 
all actors work differently. Some actors say, uh, oh, you should never see the lines uh, you know, as on a script. I say, that's how I always see them. Because until I know the play well enough, it's my geography. It's da da da. Well, what's the word there? Oh, yes, it's that word because you turn the page and then it's at the top there and the shape of the paragraphs are like that. I think everyone's got their own w ways of working. But um, I remember a friend of mine, he said, Right, if you've got a line, say the line 18 times in a row. I said, That's going to take forever. He went, That's my method. Say so 18 times in a row and just when you're absolutely sick of hearing the line, say it one more time. So if it's a speech, it's going to take quite a long time, but you can run the lines together as well. But having said that, I would say a speech is much easier to learn than lines uh, where it's conversation. Because sometimes you're thinking, have they got two lines there? Or, or very often in rehearsal, you go, is, is that all you say? Oh, right, so it's me again, is it? Whereas in a speech, <laughs> no one's interrupting you. And you just, yeah, yeah it, but I would say everyone does have their own, their own ways. Yeah. Do you ever get the panto blues? Do you mean during it? After. Oh yeah. Oh badly, badly, because because it's well though it's my birthday month. I I think February is going to be the most boring time of the year. You know, it's like you don't see you don't see many adverts. You know, for what are you doing this Shrove Tuesday? How will you spend your Ash Wednesday? You think, oh no, there's Burns Light and I love Haggis, and, but I just think it's such a boring time of the year. And I do, I'm a strong believer in the, uh, is it SAD syndrome, seasonal... Mm. Uh, affective disorder. Affective disorder, yes. Because, you know, if, you've, if, you, if you're not feeling a lot of impetus of what to do, it can get to five o'clock and it can it suddenly, you know, it's not a lot to do apart from turn on the news, then Coronation Street. Because it's so full on and because it's like... So this is totally the wrong expression, I know, but the tail wagging the dog. It's like sometimes it, it's the it's complete opposite to the anticipation and the joy. You got Christmas coming up and all like that. That panto has ended. You know, might even still be there in the middle of the bath and going, "Oh, I could have said the line that way," which is great when you do a play again. <laughs> And you go, and I have done that, where you do a play twice, maybe even three times, and you go, right, I'll try it this way. And yes, bingo, it gets the right reaction. Because you can't think of everything as well. Um, but, it, you know, it's just one of those things where it, if work comes up, great. If you're, you know, if you've got enough money in the bank to go on a really good holiday or, or some great event coming up. I mean, for me, it's like I'm passionate about watching rugby league. Whole Kingston Rovers, and uh, you know they when they're hanging by a thread as they are this season. You know it's like oh boy, please stay in the Super League. Uh, so I like love going to see them. I remember you know maybe we, we all suffer from depression occasionally, but I remember going when I think my girlfriend had left me or something like that, and I was just feeling very sorry for myself. But I remember going to a rugby match and going that gnawing feeling in the stomach. It's gone for 80 minutes. It's gone. So, I mean, that's almost a flippant thing to say, but uh, I, I'm just saying that this, this thing of the blues, yes, it's because it's been full on, it's been 190 miles an hour, and now it's, y yes, you like the rest, uh, it's great. I mean, I love the rest on a Sunday. Um, <laughs> and you feel very cotton wool. It's the only thing that happens during pantomime, because you project so much, and because you're in serious danger of losing your voice, even though you are mic'd, but the mic is just there to support the voice. You are not being amplified really at all. Um, not like a you know, cabaret singer or anything. So it's just there to give slight backup to the voice. And uh, on a Sunday, I always feel rather unwell. I don't know, very, because your body's saying, just rest. You don't have to do, you don't have to be skipping around anywhere. You don't have to project, you don't have to go into a 10 foot tank of water, you know. Uh, you don't have to do any of that today. Just enjoy a bit of a roast dinner. And, uh, and I think it's maybe because it's that time of year as well. It starts getting dark at four, you know. Um, so that I think I've tried to answer the, every possible ins and outs of that. And I would definitely say Panto Blues exist. How do you look after yourself during, during the shows? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I like a pint as much as the next person does. But, you know, you can't, obviously, late nights. I mean, when I think when me and David Leonard were young whippersnappers, 
we'd be there till four in the morning. At the Willow Club, which <laughs> used to be in, right in the middle of town there, it's closed now. It's like, it like a sort of Chinese disco. Well, it was a Chinese restaurant that had a disco in it. And the food used to be served. The kitchens were at the back where the DJ would be playing the records. The seating would be across through the dance floor. So you'd be bopping away there and this chop suey would be arriving to arms and legs flying about. <laughs> um, but it was notorious, but we did actually party quite sort of hard. But you see, when I was in hospital, the two guys arrived when I'd come out of the coma and they said, right, Mr. Barris, you know, you, you really are sleeping an awful lot. You must be up on your feet. You know, we know you've got a broken leg, but I said, look, I, I, I know that. Anyway, I've never been on a crutch, crutches before. I tried a Zimmer frame and I don't know, I just felt a bit self-conscious with it. And uh, so I said, have you got crutches? Something that's a bit more energetic. The energy needed for crutches. I mean, I go to the gym three times a week. I, I, I cycle everywhere. I've always worked out. I told them this to no avail. This Mr. Maris, you lost. All I wanted to do was sleep. And all I wanted to do when I started recuperating at my mate Gordon's flat was sleep. You know, he'd joke around saying, are you asleep again? I said, you know what? This is, the, this is bliss at the moment. If having that crash was the worst thing ever, the best feeling at the moment is to just sleep. And it's not like me. It really not like me. But when the first year I did Panto, I went to a health shop and said, what does ginseng do for you? They said, well, it's, it's good for energy. I went, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what we, uh, what we take, uh, me and Beric particularly, is Lucas Ed Sport. So I've got to advertise that because it's great. And uh, there's no age limit of what you shouldn't buy to. Um, but we used to take Red Bull. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yeah, oh, dear. Uh, too much caffeine. Too much too wildness. I mean, very get a wild look in his eye. And I'd get a wild and look, his too. poor heart. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I remember saying, we sit in the dressing room, I'm going, hey, listen, Beric, this, this will bring a smile to your face. So we said, what? I said, right, it says ingredients, Red Bull. You know what one of them is? Pantothenic acid. And I looked round, he'd left the room. <laughs> God, he's just like, I can't be bothered with this. <laughs> and he came back and said, what was the funny bit? I went, oh, come on. No, we play off each other like that all, all the time. It's what, it's what makes coming into work and sharing a dressing room an absolute delight. We've had mock rounds where people have been knocking on the door and gone, oh, you two, I could hear hammer and tongs. Because they just made up. They're just making dialogue up, you know, just to scare people a little bit. It's just what gets you through a show. Uh, there's one bit where in Babes in the Wood, there's a, a shop. The uh, Beric as the Dave is meant to be running this village store. And uh, uh, David, it was a matinee, and David Leonard, he said, oh, God, I've got to have breakfast today. Uh, I've got this sandwich here. I said, that he's, mm, yeah, I've had a full English me today. I mean, sometimes I've done a show, I've hardly anything to eat, and you start getting, like, faint, and your legs shake. Uh, I said, yeah, bet you eat all of that, you know. And you don't eat too close to the show either. He went, yeah. I was, I'm dying for the loo. Like, so I looked, I thought, right, I'm having that sandwich. So I gave it to Beric. I said, right, so I think we should bring the sandwich on during the show. He went, fantastic. The shop scene. Let's bring it in the shop scene. So David comes on, you know, 20 minutes into the panther. and says, right, can I help you? I said, oh, by the way, I think you're looking for this. He went, my sandwich! They, they took that from my dressing room. Who took it? Who did it? Like, oh, look at that there. And Beric said, oh, this chap looks starving here. And he went down, down the steps, and gave a guy in the front row the sandwich. <laughs> he said, I don't believe it. I'm starving. And he was. He was. No, um, I know Beric uh, believes sometimes in Proplos, things like that. He gave me a pro plus once, and by the song sheet, I was shaking like a, a dog. It was like, my leg was gone, and it was like, oh. I think it just affects some people in a different way. Mm. Uh, a cup of coffee is fine for me. Uh, ginseng. But Lucas said sport. And I think it's that thing where you may be halfway through the week, and you think, and you go, actually, my energy level feels pretty good. And I, it has made a difference, the Lucas said sport. You know, people say, yeah, but you're paying all that money, you could just get a load of glucose, put it in water. You go, oh. I'd rather just buy it. You know, mm. It's not that expensive. Um, yeah, so I think, but it is, it, it's, it's very, it's really important to stay healthy because remember when my son was born 
and uh, I cycled back to uh, again the infamous Bootham Crescent, where we had this terraced house, and he'd just been born and. Uh, I wasn't staying for a drink at the theatre or anything like that, but it's an absolutely bitterly cold freezing night and I'd left my top coat. So I cycled back and I got the most dreadful chill, which then led to a flu. Yeah, I know you can't catch flu off a bike or, but you know, it's off somebody, but if your resistance, resistance is so low that wherever the flu bug is, the body says, yeah, I can't protect you against that. And that's what happened. And that was absolutely terrible. I remember at night thinking, what on earth? That's like there were spiders on my legs. And I looked and it was sweat just dripping down, drip, drip, drip. Um, but you see, now I remember chatting to somebody and it, the f f most friendliest conversation, but I think to this day they don't believe me. So I said, during that, I got the flu over three days, two days maybe, but it was severe. David Leonard's same thing like and they said no 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 the real flu you can't get out of bed I said it was the real flu but I had to get out of bed there are no understudies there's a thousand people waiting there's a thousand people waiting in the evening as well and the next day uh, and if it's over the Christmas period it's two a day kind of non-stop till the kids go back to school but I said no it, it is the real flu I mean you know you don't do 34 years without getting the real flu in winter at some stage I've seen David Leonard go on, you know, uh, and what you do is you give a, a workmanlike performance where the audience wouldn't know, but you can. there's just a nuance there that you're in pain or there's a weakness. But or there are some times where you can work yourself through it. You can actually work yourself and think, I feel better than when I started now. And I'm not sure why. I think that's maybe the way the human body works with second wind, that kind of thing, metabolism. Uh, but I, oh, I know one of the worst mistakes I made was twice going to the gym on a Saturday morning and having a really good workout. I went on stage for the matinee. I was so dehydrated. So, and I think because the body was saying, you, you don't need to do a workout before these two workouts on the Saturday. Yeah, when it's one show a day in the evening, then you can maybe go to, but, and it was, I think it was like nervous exhaustion, which meant that the body, it's like fight or flight, isn't it? Why you get a dry mouth is because the last thing the body wants you to do is eat. It says, no, you run or you fight it. All these different things. And um, uh, that and the other thing was, oh, again, one Saturday lunchtime, we were living next to uh, Tony's place. Again, near Bootham Crescent. Uh, Tony's place, which, as you'll have gathered, is a fish and chip shop. And I said, you know what, I know it's lunchtime, but oh, I could murder some fish and chips with Hammond's chopped sauce, brown sauce. Oh, I can just, I can just see me eating it. Anyway, I wolfed it down. And I said, oh, I feel a bit full. I, I better set off now. I don't think I'll bike it. Yeah, my wife said, but we always bike it, so you can bike it back. I think I'll just walk. And I thought, I can walk this off. No, I felt like lead during the whole show. And I've never had that feeling before. The opposite is where you've not eaten enough. And you kind of, you kind of get by it a bit where your body's going, yeah, we're going to eat soon. Just give it, you know, 10 more minutes and you can, you can eat soon. But um, I, I think you've got to be your own physician, really. And I mean, the times that we've had, uh, you know, Beric's ended up in hospital. I've ended up in hospital. Uh, I mean, not during Panto necessarily Beric has during Panto and of course he, he said right I'm sorry I'm going to have to discharge myself because I've got an evening show to do that's when he uh, was plummeting from a uh, great height and he hit through his Wellingtons which were completely destroyed he could have smashed his leg to bits on the side of the tank and he was like limping for quite a bit then he went over on one of his high heel things and I heard this awful click and uh, like dislocation of a ligament in the just carry on and hope that it's going to be all right. But uh, in the uh, in the play Kez, I did this twenty-eight-year-old playing a fifteen-year-old. Um, there was one bit where you're meant to see the kestrel in the farmer's field, and you get over a fence and you jump down. Well, I was wearing what we call in Hull sand shoes, like really ordinary, very ordinary plimsolls, like you wear in school. And I was wearing those anyway. As I landed, I landed sort of sort of on my toes, I think. And I was like, oh, it was the worst pain ever. And I have been hit in the groin with a cricket ball when I forgot to wear my box. <laughs> it was worse than that. 
And because you've got loads of dialogue with this guy playing the farmer. So, you know, it's like, oh, what are you doing here? You know, oh, I just thought I saw this, uh, this, uh, this hawk flying above there. And I, yeah, well, don't go pinching the eggs, that's illegal. No, 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 worry, I'll be on my way. Or like that. And he was like, the actor was looking at me thinking, you've, you're in trouble, mate, are you? There's something up with your face, it's gone purple. And so I kind of hobbled off and I had to wait to the interval. It's St John's ambulance just in the wings. Uh, they called them and they said, right, they took the shoe off. I went, oh, please, please go gently. And the guy went, oh, my God. Oh. And I went, oh. the toes had gone back in a U-shape. Oh. The, 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 the heat, of, I don't understand how I do it, the heat of the shoe had, had, had forced them into a fixed position. So they said, right, cancel the show. And I said, I'm, I'm not being, you know, super brave here, but... You can't cancel a show. I can walk. But, and of course, there's a chase sequence where you're going, Kez, Kez. So all around the all, you know, where's Kez? Because Judd, his brother, has killed the hawk because mm. he didn't put his bet on. And so they said, you know, and I just, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. So of course, rushed straight to hospital afterwards. And they looked at it, and even the doctor went, oh, what's happened here? So I just landed with full weight on my toes. And, you, and you've done a show? I mean, had to, you know. So, right, let's see if we can put them back to shape. Well, I can't repeat what I said when he took hold of both toes with a pair of pliers. And it's like, he said, yeah, I think we need anaesthetic here. I went, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, no, Sherlock. Um, so, so they did. Anyway, within a few minutes, he tapped up to my sort of knee area. And I said, I can't feel anything, I can't. He said, right, here we go. So straight away, very practically, he got, and it sounded like walnuts cracking, and it just pulled them up and down. So it was like, uh, next day, it was like two big, big black gobstoppers. It was it forcing toes out oh. like that. So um, that was, you know, that, that, that was bad. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, and this is in a book by Michael Simpkins, I don't know if you know. Uh, he, an actor I worked with, and he wrote uh, a piece in The Guardian for a few years uh, about being an actor. He's written that on and off. Anyway, a friend of mine got the book, and it's, it's all the compilations from The Guardian and a few extras, and he said, Martin, you're in it. Page 92 to 95. And I went, is it the tights business? He went, yeah, yeah, Canterbury Marlowe Theatre. What it was, I'd just done my second job uh, of my career, and it was a very hot summer, doing Joseph and his amazing technical fan belt coat. And, uh, and it was a really hot summer, and uh, I remember this actor I work with, he said, well, you know what I do, I mean, just because it's so warm, I, I don't wear any underpants. What? I said, no, I wear different jeans every day, and I, you know, I, that's, but, but the deal is, and it's just more natural, you know. Really? And anyway, I really, really got into this. So I didn't wear underpants, you know. And um, so I was doing the show Twelfth Night and I was playing Sebastian, twin, uh, twin brother of Viola. So we both, for the audience's sake, they thought, which one's Sebastian, which one's Viola? They both got short hair, they both got these waistcoats on, very natty jodhpers, riding boots, you know, quite almost androgynous or, 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 or unisex, you know. So, um, uh, I was in a bit of a rush one day, and because uh, normally for the play, obviously you put a, I don't know, jock strap on or something like that. I, there's no way I could not go on with any underpants in a play. Yeah. I got dressed in such a rush. I mean, I, I was pretty late. I was there just for the half hour call, just in time. And it was a bit of a kerfuffle because we'd only been open a few days and I like to go through a few rituals beforehand and say, right, I've got my focus now. Uh, anyway, so what happens is, is that uh, at the end of act one, there being five acts, is that you've seen Viola uh, being on a shipwreck with a brother, Sebastian. They've got separated. So Viola is going about her way on this piece of land called Illyria to find out what she should do and should she try and find a brother. Now, identical situation at the end of Act 1 is the figure comes on, you think, it's Viola again. Oh no, it's got a man's voice. But it's identical to Viola. And the sea captain, Antonio, is saying, look, buddy, I know you're in a state. Your sister, she's believe drowned but won't you stay on the island just a bit longer let me look after you I'm worried about you and Sebastian is 
basically saying, uh, thanks for all your help, mate, but I, I need to pick myself up and see what I can make of life. You know, thank you for letting me stay with you. You've been great company. Okay, we'll agree to meet then. All right, we'll meet a, a tavern, the elephant, okay? We'll see how each other's getting on. Basically, that's the scene. So I come on and I stagger on with my best, <laughs> woe is me, acting. And these boots that I'm on, these riding boots, had no grip. So as I'm sort of staggering, I slid quite badly and landed with a <laughs> bang, thump, to which this school's matinee thought was hilarious. <laughs> so they, they started murmuring like that. And I thought, OK, old rule of, you know, uh, playing it with someone is, 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 right, as my dad used to say, if your dog's going to bite you, don't just give your foot, give a whole leg. So I'll really act as if I'm hurt. So it's like... <sighs> With your agony trying to crawl to the stage. And that seemed to shut them up a bit. You know, they stopped giggling and everything like that. So they know they're going to see something really serious happening. And that is until Antonio, the sea captain, comes on. Antonio, uh, Sebastian, will you stay no longer on the island? Ah, my sister. No, she is drowned. I must seek my fortune. So now, is it, oh, yeah, and I staggered towards the end of the, end of the stage and sort of was on my knees uh, and, you know, pleading with the, the captain that I, I need to go and seek my fortune. Anyway, I'm starting to say my lines. And he, he's gone. He's gone more purple than I did when I broke both toes. He's gone like Ribena Man. And he's like, he's just b barely able to speak. I'm <laughs> gabbling my lines. The laughter now is getting to be like a West End farce. And I'm going, I don't know what on earth is happening here. Anyway, I did one of my gestures. I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll gesture a bit. This will get him back on track, surely, you know. I'll, or I'll try bringing on the tears again, you know. So it's like, oh. And as I went, it's like to my left, I thought, it's like a fire door's left open or something. I was like, breezy, isn't it? I, <laughs> I looked down and there was, how can I put this in polite terms? But uh, from here to breakfast time, was the biggest rip in the tights, me having no underpants on either. So, as Mike Simkin puts it, it's the best rhythm and horn section I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the guy playing Antonio, he's just, it, then he just dried completely. He just didn't speak anymore. <laughs> and I did the whole scene of it, but just the lines. And then I tried to put my hands in front, which just got this round of applause. <laughs> as I tried to, you know, as you would, one hand in the other hand like this. And then just deliver the lines, which no one is listening to now. There, there's some OAPs in as well as kids, bus, busloads of girls in from Canterbury, you know. And it was like absolutely, and unbeknownst to me, towards the end of the scene, it's, it's uh, the, 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 the girl on the uh, book, the deputy stage manager had said this is very unprofessional but if any of the actors the cast would like to see Mr. Barris his tights are split and he's displaying all make your way to the wings very very soon because the scene is about to end in about 30 seconds <laughs> so like this and I look at the wings I could see them all going oh. <laughs> <laughs> and going cheering and everything and, uh, and when I came off it was like uh, sorry I know this very rude, but my ha I'd had the confidence that I thought, oh, if I exit like crab ways, because there's still a bit of dialogue, I'll see you at the tavern to the elephant. I do remember, and off, and that's it. So, and so I'm getting up with my back to the audience there, uh, back to the audience, walking like a crab. I'm nearly at the wings, nearly there. And it says, he shouts at me, to the elephant, and I turned round and Everything else turned around with me. It was just, oh no, it's, this, is, this is shocking. It's got life of its own, this, you know. I went into the wings and it was just silent applause as they all went, a thumbs up. It's great. I said, I feel like that. And then in Act Three, there actually is the line I have, I did expose myself for thee, which just got an evasion. It was a, oh, and then there was a talk back after the show with all these schools bust in from, from northern Kent. So, Marlowe Theatre, and, and it's, it, the chapter on that begins is preparation, uh, Michael Simpkins. Uh, and so when I got the book, I'm going like 92. Oh my, I can't believe this. So it says, right, preparation. Uh, nip to the toilet. If you're wearing a very, uh, you know, elaborate costume there, make sure you go to the loo and all that sort of things. Just the essentials. And then it says... Always wear underpants. This is midway through a chapter. It says, Martin, 
never wore underpants. I think he was from up north somewhere, <laughs> where he saw this as a badge, <laughs> as a badge of honour. <laughs> and then he said this. Now, you've got to prepare yourselves for this, folks, because I, I, I did use this expression, but he said he never wore underpants because he liked to have the sensation of the ragman's trumpet against the cloth. <laughs> and I thought, and this was so long ago, I thought, I never spoke like that, did I? Oh, we were doing a Shakespeare, so... Mm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, always be prepared because you never know what's going to happen. What's been your favourite pantomime that you've taken right part. i think I, I spoke to david about this and because beric started in the late 70s we started in the mid 80s obviously beric had done a few more before us but we started together uh in sinbad the sailor and you know we've got so many fond memories uh, the, the the great numbers in it the ones that the gags that stick in mind because it's your first one it's the first time you've got up there and it's the first time where beric said midway through the run have you guys enjoyed yourselves? You're going, yeah, it's tiring, but, you know, do you want to come back next year? Because then the audience will know you, they love you, they're, you're obviously it's working, you're a hit, you know. And that feeling as well of being wanted is great. But I have to say, the greatest spectacle I, I've ever been involved in, which beats working RSC, beats National Theatre West End, it just has to be the Railway Museum pantomime, Dick Whittington. It, when first Beric phoned me up, he said, we're in trouble this year. I said, mm, why? What, what, what sort of money? Oh, no, 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 it's... Uh, you know the theatre's being refurbished? Yeah, it's going to take a lot longer than they think. We can't use the theatre. But, but, all's not lost. But, and it's a big but. Uh, they've decided to do Railway Children again. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, because I'm, I'm going to do it in the summer. He said, yeah, they're going to keep the tent and the format for the panto. I said, I think that's possibly the greatest news I've ever heard in theatre. I went, you must be mad. Think of all the problems. Think of that. I said, think, think, of, think of David Lennon's entrance. And this is what happened. Um, he could travel 70 yards right down the middle of the track on, on a cantilever throne, which again happened, with all lights, the, the throne going up and down. David could get off at any stage of his throne, talk, which again happened in Nick's sweets and people's beer, could happen, get back on the throne, do the rest of the scene, and, and, and what, the, the possibilities are absolutely endless. Think of, the, think of the numbers of the chorus doing that could just be moving up and down the entire length, which again happened. Um, uh, and as for the shop scene, which was a piece of to the music of Selfridge, uh, Selfridges, uh, that's where it started as a very tiny shop where the audience must be thinking, hang on, I think I'm 30 yards away from this. It's like a little greenhouse. Oh my goodness, it was like a little greenhouse. It's now expanding to nearly the entire length of the platform. It's a shop, window there, door there, door there, invisible door there. And it, it just is the greatest piece of engineering I've ever seen. I mean, being in Railway Children was a dream. You've got two flags, red and the green, don't get them mixed up, as I was told. A whistle, a ticket punch, what more could a boy you want? You've got your own train set, you know. But this beat the lot. It was so fantastic. It was so... Oh, I mean, I love railways anyway. But the idea, and the, the, one of the Beric's greatest lines, because it sums up him as a dame, that we all know he's a bloke wearing boots, is, again, he said to me, but I wasn't able to help him, he said, you know, I said, Bobby from Burns, right, okay, I said, I've got some good news for you tonight. My son, Martin Barris, can't be in tonight's show. I knew that would cheer you up, you know. And then I came out of it, because he came on the, the, the real choo-choo train, steam train, uh, and I came out of this tender, this, you know, made to look like a, a, a coal tender. I came out of it, bursting bricks of coal, and going, oh, oh, yes, I am, I'm here, like that. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, you are. And that was kind of it. Then we got off, we got out, and we held dialogue over opposite platforms. So it really made the dynamic is that I'm near this part of the audience, Beric's near the furthest part of the audience, so you're never that far away from one of the actors. I say actors. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, it, it got to the third performance, and I was, I was just about to be my line, it just 
put his hand up, I know, right, that means he's going to speak. And I just said, do you know, babies, if I'd have known you were this close, I'd have had a proper shave. <laughs> that, that, I mean, even a kid watched that going, it's a man, yeah. It's a man just wearing women's clothing, you know. Uh, but to go back to what we said about Beric is, um, you know, I remember he said, he saw some play where someone was doing a, a squeaky voice or like that. I said, I couldn't tell you. I just couldn't take that for two hours. In a, I said, it's the same with audiences. And I think it's the same with his voice as, you know, very s strong, uh, Sunderland accent. Um, and that, well, it, you know, if it's kind of wittering on, if it, you know, and his makeup takes about one and a half seconds to do. But you thought I was going to say hours. Um, <laughs> but it just be... All those wrinkles and everything. <laughs> just... <laughs> Don't shoot me yeah, for that, Beric. Yeah, yeah, an evening with British latex. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Actually, he did use that line once the, when his costume fell apart. I just thought it was genius. Oh. Welcome to an evening of British Velcro. <laughs> just bonkers. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Ken Dodd, who was the other. Uh, absolute In that bracket. Uh, took my kids to see him five years ago, so he'll have been 85 then, and show finished at quarter one. Started at seven. There were two acts on, apart from him, uh, so I worked out he must have done five hours of on his own. Say 14 seconds for each gag, that's about 2,000 gags in one evening. He's, you know, of course he's got the world record for it. I remember his opening, his opening, this is five years ago, because um, I'm trying to get Richard Bean to write a play about Ken Dodd, you know. Um, but his opening five years ago was, uh, well, what a wonder, what a, what a city, a York, marvellous when it's finished. Yes, do you know, he said, hang on, <laughs> I've been upstaged by a fire engine. Uh, yeah, so he said, uh, the city of York, yes, do you know, the, uh, the council, they had an extraordinary general meeting. Three of them were sober. And, <laughs> and he just carried on, right at that, never repeated himself, you know. I went to his funeral in Liverpool last year. It was great. We couldn't get in the church. It was on the big screen. But I met him twice, and uh, he played here at the York Theatre Royal on Sunday night. I just thought, you know, my ribs, it's, it's David Leonard all over again. I can't breathe. <laughs> so I had my Ken Dodd and the Diddy record when, from when I was nine, and I came backstage and I said, so I, I, I work here kind of sometimes. Uh, could Ken sign my programme? He went, yeah, of course. It's a, it's a party after every show. So I went there, there were stacks and stacks of beer, all bought by Ken, and um, he, he said, Martin, you're, you work here, what do you do? The pantomime, and you're, oh, you're legitimate, you're an actor, I'm just a turn. I said, you're <laughs> my hero, would you sign this? Oh, to the great Martin, yes. Sir. <laughs> anyway, I said, could I ask about when you you played Malvolio in Shakespeare. He went, oh, yes, Liverpool Empire, 1971. And I said, it was really well received, wasn't it? He said, well, I believe it was, yeah. So he played, you know, Malvolio, the, the, the bad, the, the uh, big-headed steward in, uh, again, in Twelfth Night. And uh, he said, all the critics were gunning for me to, to ad-lib, you know, what a wonderful day for, you know, but I, no. And... Uh, so he said, one night, uh, this chain of office that I had, the whole thing just fell apart. And it was like, what, what, what do I do? It was, you know, pearls, uh, uh, jewels, uh, you know, all medallions, just all on the floor and no chain of office left. And at that very moment, his mistress, uh, who he serves, Olivia, comes in and she's like uh, absolutely agog. And he thought, in a flash, he, uh, he just said, I'm sorry, ma'am. When I see you, I have the strength of ten men. Mm. <laughs> and he looked up to the gods, uh, no, to the, to the flies above him and said, Sorry, Will, I had to. <laughs> Massive round of applause. Will Shakespeare would have gone loony. He would have loved it. He would have said, yeah, that's what you do. You don't just not come out with anything or <clears throat> that shouldn't have happened. You're an actor. And if you can think of something great to say. So... Uh, yeah, it was fantastic, and he was just telling me all sorts of stuff. Um, it was actually at the time of his tax thing coming up. It was the late eighties, but he was he was I couldn't believe the stuff he was coming out with. He was just like, uh, oh yes, I've got big problems. Yes, I, I phoned Samaritans the other day, and they said who's speaking. I said Ken Dodd. They shot themselves, and it was like <laughs> you just, I I don't. But this guy could. He could actually. I mean, what is it? Barry Took said, "Look, Ken's an old friend of mine," and. 
I think the way things are going, I think he will. I think he'll go down for this. He'll get about five years, but he'll do eight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just the comedy fraternity. Well, you know. Ken signed a tenor for me. I asked Did him, he? I said to him, and it's in my kitchen, pride of place. Oh. And it's. He's, I said to him, Ken, would you mind awfully? Would you sign my tenor, that's please? Brilliant. He signed it and he said, Liz won't be pleased. <laughs> 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 and, it, and it's beautiful, and it's there, That's framed, fantastic. That's and what a guy. Oh, he, well, I mean, you know, I think one of the first games I ever heard, which you just go, if you can visualise what's been said, it, it's even better. You know, the, what a wonderful day for sticking a cube through a letterbox and saying, oh, look, the Martians have landed. You know, I know what you're saying. It's and a seaside it. Th- it's going through the Martians of London. It's just... Um, and so the thing is that Richard has been looking at is saying, is there a kind of an alternative from apart from a linear biography? And there is one coming out in October. I think it's called Happiness and Tears. And it's just... It's not about dishing dirt. It's, it's what is the substance, because I love the guy too much. It's the substance of... of how particularly you can go out and tell 2,000 gags when you're 85 years old. Uh, I, I, I just, I, you know, it's and, and an avid reader as well. He'd say whenever he was on tour, he'd uh, always seek out the local library. It must have been quite a sight, just seeing Ken spend all day in the library. Yeah. Well, this leads me on to my very last question. Yeah. Your dream pantomime. You can be in it. You can be sitting in the audience watching it. You can choose the venue, and you can choose your cast, alive or dead. Right. Um, I think it would be, because I've been so fortunate, and I'm not being jammy here at all, it would be to construct, again, the Railway Museum, to do it in that format. Because Beric, I remember him, he said, I, I totally eat my words. I just didn't think it would work. It works better than Senior Arch. He said, and he kept saying it, he kept saying it. It was like a kid. He kept saying, I'd just be so sorry. I'd be so sorry to see this go. But I realised the expense for a regional theatre of constructing that, unless you're going to do two or three productions. Who knows? Who knows? It's been done twice now. Uh, Railway children with that configuration. But that's a thought. Uh, I think Susie is my sister. David is the villain. Barry, the man. It just couldn't get any better than that. Any production? I wouldn't mind. I, I wouldn't mind. Um, there's only one. Was it Beauty and the Beast in 1998? Where I didn't have a lot to do in that. But I did the following year. That's when it came on as Austin Powers. <laughs> oh, that was that was fantastic. It was uh, it was um, I I made up this. I said to Beric, you know what? Come on. I think I should come over to. Uh, is it called Bossa Nova? Yeah, Soul Bossa Nova. Soul Bossa Nova. So I said, could I write my own little ditty? He said, do what you want, you know. And David Leonard said, God, you look just like Mike Myers. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, the wig and the red, you know. And he was there. Uh, Welcome all, you dudes and chicks. I'm a cool, cool cat from off the flicks. A way out happening kind of guy. Like, can I help but make girls cry? My hair's the kind you want to get lost in. To the powers that be, I'm known as Austin. Yes, Austin Powers, international man of misery. A mystery, yeah. <laughs> so, and then I did the, yeah, baby, ooh, behave. And uh, so Susie comes on saying, who do you think you are? <laughs> I'm Austin Powers, baby. And I was thinking, what can I say that's absolutely clean? Uh, you know, do we all later? Uh, so it was just all, you know, kiddie sort of stuff like that. Daft play it, knockabout. Uh, and then she said, right, I don't believe you are. You're just my brother. Oh, come on, baby, dress like this. So um, she said, right, take off that ridiculous wig. And, oh, all right then. And then I added a line when she said, take off those ridiculous spectacles. I said, they're not mine, they're Lynn's. <laughs> I used to get a bit of a groan. I said, I mean, this is the best bit. This is what Susie invented as well. She then looks at me and says, and take out those ridiculous teeth. I mean, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then Beric charges on, I remember. So I've got the, the wigs not on anymore. The glasses there. Still got my own teeth in, obviously. And Beric says, what's going on here? It's uh, 
Oh, sorry, that's it. No, Susie wasn't playing my sister that year. She was just someone in the village, yeah, that I thought was attractive to me. That's why I dressed up as Austin Powers. And she's saying, you look ridiculous. So she's just a villager. Because Beric says, and who's this then? Who's this floozy? Ah, pay no attention to herself. She's only after your winter fuel allowance. <laughs> It's that pithy, earthy sense, you know, of... of um, I mean, I would, I, to be honest, I would like to play uh, up at where I get to do Austin Powers again. That would be, because there will be people, kids, teenagers even, because that was the year 2000, who will have never seen it, you mm -hmm. know, because they were too young. To just do that, because um, it was just great doing the voice, and Austin Powers was absolutely everywhere. Everyone was waiting for the third film to come out. And, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I just the... I, we had a scene once, me and Beric, and it was like, I called it the Beckett Bucket scene. Because we'd just done Chinese Laundry Blues, Aladdin. Uh, it was a great number with washboards and everything. Uh, and then uh, I think Beric came in and said, right, all right, no time for dancing, time to get the laundry going. Oh, son. Uh, something to tell you like that so I pick up a bucket and sit down so I sat an upturned bucket and he sat on one and we had this surreal dialogue what is it like uh, but mum you promised to take me to see the what is it Neolithic zombies of Upper Poppleton tonight at the cinema and all that no something like and he's never quite written something as, as absurd as that before and the audience was like into it and there's a lot of sort of tongue twister stuff but that was when I think that was the first year where he had the thing, uh, what happened to our dad? Oh, dad. Yeah, dad. Dad died. <clears throat> dad died. Dad died. Where did dad die? Dad died in Baghdad. Did dad? Did dad? Did dad what? Did dad die in Baghdad? Aye, did dad. <laughs> and he gets this old, uh, like, curtain, you know, like Mary Poppins type bag. Mm. Aye. And he's uh, almost talking about himself. Dad picked up this old bag in Baghdad, did Dad, and then produces it, <laughs> just when you think it means him, like that. Then puts the bag down, and then it carries on further. So Dad died in Baghdad, did Dad, and Dad picked up this old bag in Baghdad, did Dad. And it's like getting more and more, like, Beric's thinking, why did I start this? So he's going, <laughs> yes, Dad did, did what? Dad did pick up this old bag in Dad, Dad, and then Dad died in Baghdad, did Dad. What did Dad die of in Baghdad, did Dad? Dad died! of a deadly duodeno in Baghdad. <laughs> and it just gets, so the audience are going, there can't be any more Ds in there. There can't be any more Ds. And then it just, but it ends with, I forget how it ends, but it ends with, diddly, I don't die, diddly, I don't die, I don't die, bang, thank you. And that's it. So and what I love is about pantomime, when a chord plays, like, ba bam, you go, that's it. That's a routine. Like the Abbot Costello, who's on first base, da 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 da, da because that's his name, is who, yeah. And it's there's, there's wonderful builds. But there's one bit where, when I got script, sent the script for uh, One Man, Two Governors, I'm looking at the script on the internet, I'm scrolling through, I'm going, oh my God. Because Richard Bean, uh, when he came to see uh, um, Sinbad, another Sinbad I think we've done it three times in 2006 basically he brought his daughter along so I saw him at the bar afterwards and he said I, I, I don't know what to say I said what you've always got something to see a writer he said I've never, se I've never seen a pantomime like that it's, it's, it is just it's surreal it appeals to everybody Beric's just it, it's a bloke in a frock it, it, you just skip in everywhere David Susie you just uh he said, right, um, when's Beric retiring? And he's half joking, half seriously. I said, I don't know, I don't know anything about that. He said, I want to write either a pantomime or a farce. Uh, because up to that point, Richard had written plays. I mean, it's top of the tree plays. But his foray into farce and pantomime, which kind of coupled together a bit, those. And he said, that's, I definitely have got my sights on that. And that's how One Man to Governor started. So obviously he'd seen the pantomime. And uh, so I'm scrolling through, and there's a section where these East End villains are saying, right, you deliver the goods to uh, this village, beginning with D. And he says, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, do you know? Oh, something like Didcot or something. Like, mm. Do you know Didcot? Did what? No, Didcot. Do you know Didcot? Yeah, it's a via uh, Dagenham, isn't it? Yeah. Well, if you're doing it wrong, if you, you're doing it wrong, if you go by Dagenham, because it did cost it, and it's all the D's like that. So uh, I'm staying at <laughs> Richard's, and I said, oh, Beric is finally going to get to see the show, is he? He said, you know the D routine is, listen, I said, Beric's going to realise it's such a fantastic play, and it's, 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 it's flattery. Because, you know, to, no, no um, uh, wordplay routines would probably be that original. You pick a letter, and that's it, really. It could be W's. D's a good one, because it's a plosive, as well as, like, B's and that. Um, but he, he was genuinely a bit... You, you don't think I'll sue, do you? Because <laughs> Beric is a writer as well as an actor, mm. and Richard is a writer, so... But Richard... Uh, I remember... And he won't mind me saying this, but I think Richard is all the better for uh, uh, knowing. Because when you first meet him, and I, he said to me, I gather you were... Oh, yeah, yeah. I gather you do uh, an impersonation of me. I said, Richard, I, no, I, I, no, no, can't hear it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, he's very much his own man because sometimes when <clears throat> you've seen him for a read through and you go, Richard, we old mucker, and a big hug, and it's like, yeah, 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 nice to see you. Yeah. As if he's thinking, did I leave the gas on or something like that. Um, but Richard surprised me because I thought he was quite introverted, but did quite a few years of stand up at Edinburgh Festival. Um, wrote all his own gags and stuff, you know. Um, and apparently was really very, very good. So, it, you see, I, people have said to me about doing stand-up, and Richard Bean has said to me about doing stand-up, I take my hat off to... I really, really do. To me, it would be squeaky bomb time, because you know, what, if, what if they don't laugh and you run out of material? But Richard Bean's advice to me was, if you've got enough material, you, you will... And the things you'll be saying are funny. They, they'll laugh. And they're warm to you as well. But I have yet to do something like that. I mean, I don't think I've even played... I don't think I've even played a stand-up in a, in a play. Because um, there's a wonderful play, Trevor Griffith's Comedians, um, which, you know, I would l love to do something like that. Because it's, it's comedy. What, you know... It, it, at drama school, I remember we did... First term was introductions and vocal techniques and stuff like that. I think third term was comedy, right, comedy technique. And it was great. I, I absolutely adored it. But the first question the teacher really respected, she said, right, what is comedy? And none of us got it, really. We put things that uh, give a little factor to it, things that, you know, there's people falling over and all like that. And somebody said about the safety factor, like, you know, if Charlie Chaplin falls over after being hit by custom pies and does not get up, and it says at the end, you go, oh, he's been killed in some way. So it's the safety factor. Phew, I'm okay, folks. Right, I'll give you what for. So um, she said, right, okay, this is what I believe comedy is. It's something that makes people laugh, right? And we're thinking, yeah. So that doesn't mean actors in a rehearsal room or because you can fall flat on your face. Something that you believe is hilarious in rehearsal because you know that person's uh, intonations. You know, you can go, why do audiences... Is it the way I'm telling it? Or, or as Beric says very often in the Fanto, I think we'll cut that line tomorrow night. Never gets a laugh, you know. And then, But that in itself gets the laugh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was expecting... Oh, just sometimes, you know, yeah. I was expecting a bit more from that. Maybe... Maybe, maybe tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah so, it, but it, it is that thing that, you know, and w w when we have last night gags, what Barry cannot abide is a pantomime where he's in gags that the audience can't see, mm. or that someone's got the fits of the giggles. He says it's an absolute insult. Or even in, even in, uh, even in the run of the pantomime, not just, you know, the last night or anything like that, because the gags are always fantastic played by, by the stage crew. But his belief is, in Panto, if something goes wrong, it's only a Panto. You can tell the audience, I'm sorry, everybody, that, that should have happened, you know. He says, I don't, I don't mind that. But fits of giggles about something that the, the audience... If they can see it, the audience, it's great. We're all in on it, yeah. Mm. But I think what Berry maybe, maybe to just, you know, gainsay him a little bit there is... Beric has the utmost confidence to stop everything and tell the audience. I think what he's saying is, feel free if in a love duet something happens or a piece of scenery falls down, stop, 
Sorry, that isn't good. We'll have to start again now. Or they love it. They love it. But I think you need a bit of chutzpah to do that and carry it off. Um, I was there when the uh, fire alarms went off. Ah, yes, yes, yeah. Literally about two minutes before the end of the first act. Yes, yeah. And we had everybody to, had to go out to the... We had to <laughs> gather. Had to gather outside, and you just resumed it, when it, we it, came it, back it, in. Very often <laughs> in snow. Uh, I think the first year it happened, there was... Uh, what happened was um, a Boy Scout, and he was very sorry about it, I put his elbow through a fire alarm. So, uh, you know, audience evacuated, we evacuated, and uh, into the snow... And we had to stand uh, opposite the theatre. Well, Beric said, well, I'm not standing opposite the theatre. He said, I need a cig. So um, <laughs> I was sort of smoking along with him then, as, as was David Leonard and as was Susie, who haven't for years. But we all happened to. I don't know. Different times. But uh, so I said, yeah, but the, the, the assembly point has to be, he said, get in the car. Go out. I'm not freezing out there. In, in this, we're doing a show, you know. So we all sat there, all tabbed up in his car <laughs> and while they're all looking for us where's Barry Martin Davis I said listen I better go and tell them that you know they think we're there fried to a crisp in the wings or something you know? <laughs> well Martin thank you so much for taking part in the oh it's been an absolute pleasure absolute pleasure yeah it's great, great. thank you so much and uh, I hope you enjoy the York Theatre Royal for many more years to come <laughs> <laughs>